Jeff CSO Network Net, uh, regional focal points and members, CSO representatives, indigenous peoples and local communities, agency representatives, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Jeff CSO consultations. And we are very glad to have you with us. My name is Susan Waidaka and I will be your master of ceremonies. Working with me is a great team who will be helping out with the chat and any other issues that may come up. As we always do before every council meeting, the Jeff Secretariat together with the Jeff CSO Network representatives of the uh, representatives of the IPLC and others in the partnership organize the Jeff CSO consultations. As part of the updated vision to enhance civil society engagement, which was uh, approved by the council at its third, 53rd meeting, which stressed that on the importance of enhancing engagement with civil society during council meetings. Since then, the council has invited CSOs and the Jeff Secretariat to facilitate consultations such as this on relevant topics prior to the Jeff council meetings. The 62nd council meeting takes place next week and we look forward to seeing some of you in person. As many of you know, we have just finished a successful Jeff Aid replenishment with an increase in funding of 30%, providing our boost in our efforts to address environmental degradation. So the theme of today's, the theme of today's consultation is inclusive microfinance expanding access to microfinancing in support of local actors and actions for the environment and climate action in Jeff 8 and beyond. The objective of the consultations is to highlight what microfinancing is and explain the evolving field of green inclusive microfinance. We will also discuss and present examples of Jeff engagement with micro, small and medium enterprises and discuss the role of public private partnerships as well as exploring real solutions and best practices. We are excited to have an exciting lineup of speakers and moderators who I will introduce as we go along. So the agenda for today is that we will have a welcome remarks from two key people. And then we have a keynote speaker, an expert on microfinance who will set the stage for us. Thereafter, we will have two sessions facilitated by two of my colleagues. And uh, in one, we will listen to CSOs and regional NGOs, while the second session, we have an opportunity to listen to microfinance institutions. So sit back and enjoy. Now, without much further ado, I would like um, to introduce the chair of the Jeff CSO Network. Um, Regine, put up the presentation. Uh, Mr. Akteruzaman Sano to make his opening remarks. Mr. Sano is the chair of the Jeff Meeting CSO Network since 2019. He works on stakeholder engagement and institutional strengthening, as well as gender mainstreaming. He also focuses on climate change adaptation. He has also worked closely with Save the Earth Cambodia. Welcome, Sana. Very good morning to everybody. On behalf of the GFCSO Network, I welcome everyone on board and uh, this is one of the greatest opportunity for the Jeff CSO network to welcome the Jeff Secretariat, Jeff, Jeff Council members, Jeff partners, and uh, civil society networks, private sectors, and everybody from this uh, our globe. This is a unique opportunity for the Jeff CSOs, CSOs, SGPs, uh, private sectors to interact with the uh, Jeff 
uh, secretariat and JEP councils uh, to see how better we can engage. And here we will try our uh, best to present what is doable and how the JEP CSO network, other CSOs, indigenous, indigenous people's groups, uh, they can contribute much more to achieve the target of the JEP. And you have heard that uh, Susan mentioned that we just finished uh, JEP 8 replacement meeting with new paradigm of uh, development. So there is a very inclusive approach and where on globally um, we will be going to do a lot of things much more uh, for the environmental issues. And as a part of that, the uh, donor countries, they have um, uh, made greater uh, contribution to the JEP um, and increased uh, its contribution 30% that is to 5.25 billion. So before going to my presentation, please uh, keep the first slide. Not yet, not this one, just the first one. First one. Okay, thank you. So JFCSO network works uh, globally with all the civil society groups. And uh, we have a global um, uh, level, we have uh, chair, vice chair, we have regional focal points. Uh, we have indigenous people's representatives. And we have country level, we have country focal points. And in each, in each country, uh, there are uh, focal points uh, based on the JEP focal areas. So um, biodiversity, climate change, international water, chemical uh, and waste, uh, land degradation, um, indigenous people's representative, uh, youth representative. So altogether, every country we are uh, making very good visibility because uh, whatever the things we are doing global level, it is more important to see from the country level. So as a part of that, uh, we are uh, making our highest level efforts to make this uh, visibility uh, at the country level. And also we have established the global steering committee uh, from five key continents like North America, uh, South America, Caribbean, Mesoamerica, there is one representative, North America, Canada, there is one um, uh, representative, Africa, one, Asia Pacific, one, Europe, one. So total five representatives to establish the global steering committee. The objective to be more uh, efficiently coordinate, uh, to uh, collaborate so that we can make meaningful contribution to the JEP initiatives and add value to the uh, governments. And one of the key objective of the JFCSO network to add value uh, with the government initiative. So this is uh, the JFCSO network's uh, key vision. Next slide, please. Uh, thanks for this uh, very needful issue, inclusive microfinance, that expanding access to microfinance to support the local actors and actions. So when we talk about the microfinance, why this microfinance is? Because this is one of the key mechanism where the people at risk, the people don't have that level of resources at the community level, and they can access to the financial uh, supports. So, and you know this microfinance, the Grameen Bank, they won the uh, Nobel Prize in microfinance. So we understand how the importance of microfinance is. Uh, but what is new in this microfinance uh, of the JEF? That we need to uh, make it clearer and we need to hear uh, from each and every one of you. So our target group um, at the local level, the actors, the community members, the poor people, uh, they need to uh, be the owner of their uh, initiatives so that uh, this is not something what is happening around because there are a lot of good experiences and there are a lot of bad experiences. Uh, in my experience, uh, there are a lot of ex um, uh, projects, uh, institutions of microfinance that become the latest version for making money investing the poor because they put high rate of interest and then the borrowers, they cannot refund that money. And as a result, the, once they borrow, uh, they need to reschedule the loan. They increase the loan and then cannot refund. They increase the loan, cannot refund. At last, sometimes uh, they uh, fell in very difficulties. And there are also examples that um, 
some borrowers, they suicide because they cannot refund the loan. Their land, their property, everything gone to the microcredit, microfinance institution. So we don't expect this type of microfinance. We, we expect that is climate friendly, that is uh, environmental friendly, and that is friendly to the borrowers. So- Mr. Sano, um, yeah. one more minute. Thank you. Yes. So the low, uh, the Jeff inclusive microfinance should focus on what? It should target the local actors, livelihoods through environment and climate uh, related activities. They must do the, uh, the climate risk, what are their risk have, and then they, they must collaborate with the local authorities so that they can develop the risk reduction action plan and they can work together with the local. Because any initiative at the community level it should not be isolated. It should be collaborated. It should be partnered with the local people and everyone should own it. Men, women, children, elderly people, people with disabilities, everyone must be the key actor, not the borrower. So uh, with this intention, uh, we expect this will happen. Thank you. Next slide, please. So based on our experience, I'm going to share my our one experience. This is from HGP, and you will be very happy to hear that it was done, HGP experience in Cambodia, it was done in 2008, 7, 8, but still there are something going on. So that experience I, I, I'm going to share, but here I want to show how the microfinance should work. So when microfinance go to the community level, so there should be funding, op funding options. Uh, it can be uh, through NGO, it can be through SME, it can be through any way, but it should go to the community level and then they, they shall have to take care of the technical options. Here are technical options mean that they know where to invest, how to invest, because they cannot just borrow money and leave it. If you borrow money and leave it, then it is not anything new and what is happening around it is same thing. We must have something unique opportunity, unique mechanism of the Jeff supported microfinance. So, and this technical support, it can develop, it can come up with a lot of ideas based on the local skills and capacities. And then they should have the access to the market because when the people borrow money, they will produce something. If there is no market, then again, they will fall in danger. So these three things, uh, this triangle approach must work in a very parallel way. And one of my recommendation is this, uh, we have HGP globally well-established. If the Jeff support strengthen the HGP facility, uh, then uh, it, it will be easier and we are our, all the global establishment of the small grants program uh, under UNDP, it is very uh, well functioning. And we, are, uh, we have these good experiences. Many of them have good, good experiences and then that can add higher value uh, rather than creating something new. So thank you. Next slide, please. This is one experience. Uh, where we 2008 we developed this you can see left side the school child used to drink water from here you can see the another picture the water ground water level and it is not healthy for even a cow and in one uh, jar we we just uh, filtered the muddy and you can see at the bottom of the uh, filter what level of uh, clay is there so all together if we see the community level, they are at highly higher risk. And if we want to help them, we have to give them with a full package of um, uh, mechanism. If it is isolated, then they will not be able to, uh, they will not be able to uh, manage anything. So uh, this is very important that we, we uh, recommended uh, to make it a third, uh, we, we re recommended to make it a third level of, uh, third level uh, three triangle approach. When it goes with a triangle approach, then it can, it will work with the uh, very much uh, uh, coordinated way. And it will uh, make the thing happen very successfully. So uh, please, uh, next slide, please. Next, okay, good. So uh, here, and the text. So 
So uh, this and the first top picture, this we made community revolving fund. We didn't just give money one time and they borrow and then they need to refund with interest. We didn't make that way. We made like example, uh, the uh, certain percentage we allow for them to uh, get as the admin cost, like the NGO or the, uh, the SME who want to facilitate this microfinance to the community level. So we made it a revolving fund so that the community can own it and community can borrow it several times. They can borrow many times as they want. And they, this, this become their money. It is not my money. It is not any more SGP money or it is not any more any uh, agency's money. It is the money owned to the community. And with, with the local authority, in presence of the local authority, the lady is leaving, she uh, receiving the money, she's the district deputy governor. And standing near him, the local commune leader. And there are two representatives from Sedia, they are handing over the money. So that means to the local people, we give in presence of the local authority. So local authorities accountable and they're supportive for that. And then we went for um, safe drinking water, we went for a chicken raising, duck raising, pig raising, home gardening. And you can see uh, this some small, small construction of pillars. So during the time they don't have any work, they can do other things. So it is not that they have to do something exactly. They have to be innovative based on their needs and situation. And what they did is like this water filter, they borrow money from this revolving fund and they give back to the revolving fund committee. And the committee uh, formed by the local people. So they, uh, this local money, uh, they, are, they can use and they can give it back to them, to, um, uh, to the local, uh, local um, committee. Again, they can borrow. So they can do it multiple times, not only one time, because risk is not just one single issue. The risk is multi-purpose. So we have to design in a way so that they know how to address their wider area of the risk. So this is one of the experience and um, the time we introduced this project, uh, there was no duck raising because it was a dry season, dry community, drought affected area. But later, they, some families, they started raising duck. And they have three, 400 ducks now after 10 years. So this is an example of resilience. Unless we can guarantee the financial resilience, no sustainability will be there. The people have only one source of income. People used to go to the um, uh, uh, Thailand, people used to go to the city and nobody who has good experience, capacity, educated, they are not staying at the community level. As a result at the community level, children and elderly people become more at risk. So when they have local livelihood, then they have more opportunity. And then the youth started to stay there. And we engage the youth to buy eggs, duck, chicken, pig from them and sell to the local town. So they get the higher price, community, local people, local actors, they get the actual price, market price. So it become a value adding process and that added value to sustainable. Thank you, next slide, please. Sano, you think you can wind up soon so we can... I, I, I will not, um, I will just, um, this is a presentation that the data that shows uh, how it added value. I am not going to read it because our time is limited. And if anyone is interested, we can share this uh, presentation. So overall, um, uh, in 2009, there was an assessment. We found the... Um, progress 2013, there was another assessment, we found another uh, success. So this is how the quantitative value add. So next slide, please. So here actually we um, try to focus on uh, enhancing eco economic resilience for disaster risk reduction. And um, um, for your kind information, we paid very good attention because it was my PhD um, uh, thesis uh, topic, how to um, uh, climate risk financing. So we paid 
very good attention, visited the community, talked to the people, learned their challenges, and tried to address how it can be. So all together, we can uh, see how it um, uh, make the community very successful. Thank you. Next slide, please. This is few things that need to share. Elements like beneficiary needs assessment. When we make a team or 10, 20 people, we make a group of the uh, needful people from the community level, they have to have a needful assessment. Because if borrow money, don't invest in a proper productive way, then they will be defaulted. And they will, at last, they will be in danger. So it is the role of the responsibility who is giving them money because they don't have that level of capacity. If they have that capacity, then they would not be poor. So we have to support them. Second is risk, vulnerability, and capacity quantification. If we don't know really what exactly the problem is, we need to qualify, we need to rank it, we need to score it. If there is, a, example, if there is a drought, what is the level of drought? We talk about the economic development. We need to see how much they earn one day how many number of sources of income they have. Which doing by learning is very important. We cannot do something what is happening ar around the world already. There are a lot of experiences. The name is green financing, green this, excellent, excellent. But we have to see at the community level, how much money they are receiving, how much level of their re poverty is redu reducing. And then project development and implementation, it should be with the local authority because any isolated development cannot be measured. This example, we collaborated with the local authority, it reflected of the local authority's monthly report. So government knows what does Jeff contributing. A lot of progress has been making, but there is no connectivity. As a result, the government reports, it does not reflect. So we have to make it happen. And then, process of monitoring. We make it self-monitoring because this mechanism is very much important to keep monitoring as they don't have enough level capacity. So if we don't make it self-monitoring mechanism, then how long we can external monitoring can continue? It cannot. Thank you. Next slide, please. And then if we talk about the resilience, then we have to see, as for example, num what make this project resilience and why it is re resilience. If we talk about the financial mechanism, uh, financial um, uh, economic development for the particular uh, family or community, before they had one source of income, now they have three to four sources of income. Before they had one day uh, $2.5 to $3 income, now they have six, seven, eight dollar income. So this is the way we can quantify and claim this is resilient. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, my, this is last slide. So the key lessons and so key lessons is when we let women, children, and elderly people borrow money, and husband or man, they become the supporter to borrow. Then there is more accountability. And we, we found it, it is all success. When only men borrow money, it is not always success. This is our experience. I am not against men, I am a man. But <laughs> this is our experience. Second is, the cases, we, uh, we work together, it should be connected with the uh, local risk reduction action plan. Nothing should be allowed to go out. As for example, if I borrow money, I want to buy a phone, a smartphone. That should not be the objective of the money. So money should be borrowed only for some particular field. So our uh, recommendation is it should be gender responsive. As I told you, if a family borrow money, mother or daughter or grandmother should borrow money. Father, grandfather or son, the man should be the supporter. And women are more responsible, in our experience, women are more resp responsible for the family development. 
comparing to more man. So financing, technical support, and market-oriented mechanism should be established. Just not give money. Then it, it, it will become as it used to be, and you can see around the world. And when we think about the sustainability, we need to think the sustainability for two parts. One part is NGOs or the SMEs, who is facilitating to let the local actor access to money. So their sustainability should come not from the big interest rate, but from the third level of activities, from the market access. We talked about chicken raising, duck raising, or fish raising, because these are the common, and there can be some other um, activities at the grassroots level. So what is their product? This product, they can help to market, and that would be their main sources of earning for their sustainability. Interest, high interest cannot be the indicator for the sustainability of the uh, middle uh, institutions. And if we can do this, then the financial resilience will come. And we, we um, in our experience, we have identified, it, it is not the uh, Bible that it is fixed. It is an example. So financial resilience, of course, we have to quantify. If there is currently one sources of income, they have to have three to four, five sources of income. If they have $1 income today, and they have to have more than $1 income. And then if it is a continuous process, then that is sustainable. And then we can claim this is a resilience. If not, it will be so difficult for everybody. And uh, thank you very much for this time. And if any question, um, we will uh, attend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sano, for a very interesting um, case study, which you are, of course, very familiar with being, uh, I believe, co-chair of the Save the Earth Cambodia. Um, I'm sure we will refer to and remember that those examples, uh, you brought up quite a few issues, gender issues, issues of risk, and um, we, will, we, have, we have noted that. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll come to them when we have a moment. So now, without further ado, I would like to welcome our own uh, Francoise Claude, who is uh, the Director of Strategies and Operations at the Jeff Secretariat, to give opening remarks. Francoise. Thank you, Susan, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. I'm uh, very happy to provide these opening remarks on behalf of uh, our CEO, Carlos Manuel, who's traveling back to DC to join us next week and could not be with us. Um, Sano, of course, has brought us straight into substance. So I will be, uh, I'll try to be brief with these introductory remarks so that we can carry on discussing content here. Now, you know that for a couple of years now, we have been uh, meeting uh, on a biannual basis. Uh, to run these consultations with civil society and they offer all of us a great opportunity to discuss and to learn from civil society on important topics. As in all previous consultations, I'm confident that this deep dive on inclusive microfinance will showcase experience that we have across the Jeff portfolio and beyond, right? Uh, we take the knowledge in on our topics from where we can get it. And that's part of what we do together. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Sano and the Jeff CEO Network for the support that they have brought to us in organizing this consultation, as well, of course, as to all uh, partners, presenters, and participants who are joining us today. Um, as Susan mentioned, this is a very special time. It's a very uh, special moment when we welcome a new uh, tranche of Jeff action through replenishment. We've been very successful in the completion of this replenishment. And uh, the process uh, has highlighted the contribution of local innovation of civil society actions. We've had discussion around those topics and uh, the replenishment process has converged on approaches what are, which are really aiming at increasing Jeff's engagement and financing to civil society. Carlos Manuel, our CEO has been on record uh, oftentimes for saying that Jeff resources are intended for countries, not just for the government of those countries. Countries are certainly more than the governments and they include civil society, they include NGOs, they include private sector, communities and beneficiaries, of course. So 
with all of that, we're not starting from scratch. From scratch, we have um, actively engaged civil society uh, throughout the Jeff history in our programs and in our projects. At the onset of Jeff Seven, the Jeff Council approved the new stakeholder engagement policy, and this policy has helped to further boost the role of the of the CIO, of the CSOs in general in the development, in the execution and in the monitoring and evaluation of Jeff projects and programs. In addition, of course, we have, uh, and you all know it, the small grant program, which has served as an anchoring point for Jeff financing uh, modality for now close to 30 years. And it provides a demand-driven grant mechanism, which uh, fuels local actions and supports local communities and marginalized groups. Uh, it grows capacity it draws their capacity to access the needed financial resources to engage environmental challenges. And that's exactly the idea. This program has, as of today, channeled uh, more than 600 million grant funding to CSO and to CBOs worldwide. So we have a solid basis of experience here to build on as we engage further. Now, the Jeff Aid strategy builds on those achievements. It outlines uh, uh, a direction for greater engagement with civil society, and it reinforces the support that we can provide through our program. This area that we're discussing today is one in which the GEF is looking to further invest, and uh, that's why Council retained this topic of including microfinance, which we believe can play a greater role in the future of uh, GEF engagement with uh, civil society. As Sano very eloquently reminded us all, we know that uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises, MSMEs as we call them, are, are often not well equipped to absorb the economic effect of environmental degradation or to deal with the losses which are caused by climate change. So women, youth, uh, IPLC entrepreneurs continue to lack the financing to support this important role. Uh, and as Sano mentioned, the whole package of bringing together good, uh, impactful idea on global environment together with funding option, with technical support, and with access to market through projects where necessary is a direction for, for greater impact on this. Um, the IU also has worked on the topic and the recent report that uh, they have produced highlighted Jeff's engagement with MSMEs as a very important source of innovation. Uh, it also stressed the importance of MSMEs as partners to generate global environment benefit. And, uh, and this IEO report talked about the many challenges that MSMEs uh, face, including their insufficient access to capital and, and business related challenges as, as, as mentioned by Sano. So this uh, Jeff history of engaging and supporting micro, small and medium enterprises, including smallholder farmers, uh, which uh, are small private uh, enterprises within the context of climate change and of biodiversity is what we want to talk about today. Um, we have uh, in Chef 7 more recently, eh, we, we have begun working with green inclusive microfinance institutions. So this is not entirely new here. We have the Jeff Challenge Program for Adaptation Innovation, for instance, which has supported financing to smallholders in partnership with, with very important leading microfinance actors, the Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation, the uh, BNP Paribas, the uh, Banco de Fomento Agropecuario uh, in El Salvador, and the Right Camif Microfinance Network in, in Central America and the Caribbean. So we have these, these uh, areas of experience which we want to enlist in defining the future of uh, these actions. Um, now, Jeff has also worked with community beneficiaries through its small uh, grant program in Jeff, right? Uh, it, uh, uh, in Jeff 7, this program has supported local community groups to develop their business skills and to establish uh, themselves as more competent MSMEs. So it is all these experience that we are going to build on as we move into Jeff 8. And uh, in Jeff 8, we will be launching an MSME pilot as part of our small grant program in Jeff 8 in a special window. And this initiative intends to explore opportunities to partner with microfinancing entities to support MSMEs led by women, by youth, by indigenous people and local communities 
uh, and uh, we hope very much to experiment further in those ex in those en engagements. In addition to Jeff 8, uh, the uh, programming strategy on adaptation to climate change for both LDCF and SCCF includes a key focus on inclusive microfinance to support financial sectors transition towards inclusive biodiversity oriented and climate change positive finance. So all that work is, um, is the foundation on which we're grounding our discussion together with the experience of all participants. And that is very much what is bringing us today around this discussion. We are very fortunate to be joined by a prominent actor in the inclusive green microfinance area, as well as of course the Jeff partners at the global and local level. We'll be learning from their experience. We're looking forward to hearing their voices and we're welcoming you all to that debate, which we hope to have as interactive as possible. So thank you very much once more for joining us. Welcome to all and looking forward to a very rich discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francoise, for rightly situating us in Jeff 8 and what we can expect moving forward. Um, I note that the chat is very active. Please continue being active in the chat, uh, uh, talking and, and, and providing your comments and any questions that you might have. And now I would like to uh, uh, please remi remember to mute yourselves. Uh, just keep checking, uh, mute yourselves so that we don't have any interruption. But uh, Marie Law, please mute yourself. And it is now my pleasure to invite our keynote speaker, Ms. Natalia Rialpe. Ms. Rialpe is the director and co-founder of Hedera Sustainable Solutions, a tech company dedicated to developing software solutions to help financial institutions efficiently analyze their clients' needs and demands in terms of basic services and track their contribution to the SDGs. They believe that microfinance institutions are a powerful vehicle for sustainable development and have great impact on people. Welcome, Natalia. Well, thank you very much, Susan, for this um, welcome words. I'll proceed to share my screen. All good. Yes, we can see your screen. There is something all of us already know. Climate change is caused by human activity. And what could be the second thing? Any guess from any of you? Human inaction. I have been invited today to defeat that climate inaction. My name is Natalia Real Pecarillo. I am CEO of my company, Edera Sustainable Solutions, and um, also Klaus Topfer Sustainability Fellow at the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, where I launched the project Impact Driven and Action Based Research. And I'm co head of the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Finance Action Group of the European Macrofinance Platform. I was told that you are already convinced that climate change exists and is real. Hurricanes, tropical cyclones, intense rains, heat waves, severe droughts are happening. And we know that the causes and we observe them and still we are the audience in this cinema, how our politicians debate whether these efforts are enough or not. But how can we talk about climate justice when those that are most affected are left behind? And these are the clients of the macrofinance sector. Data on climate change vulnerability shows us that the global south are the countries with more susceptibility towards the accelerated climate change. And unfortunately, you know, already these maps, the same regions are the ones with the lowest GDP per capita. It is urgent to protect them, and we cannot afford to stand still. Let's dimension the challenge that we have. According to the World Bank, from data in 2018, the rural areas account for 79% of the total poor. 
we have 70, 736 million people that live in extreme poverty in the world, and 413 people, million people are in sub-Saharan Africa. These are the red spots that we just saw in the previous map. Smallholder farmers and macro enterprises, micro entrepreneurs continue to be underserved and underfinanced in their capacity to invest and protect the environment, and also in the capacity to enhance their climate resilience. But we will say here, and this is a webinar, no, hey, we are saved, we are discussing, we are engaging, our politicians are representing us, we are having conferences and we envision to have a better future. And actually, we have an SDG for that. The truth is we need to talk about finance and how can we ensure that those vulnerable countries can become more resilient via boosting green inclusive finance. Today, I will guide you on this thematic. I'll talk about access to finance, green inclusive finance, where do we stand, challenges and way forward. First, I will show you how the financial ecosystem works, looks like for those excluded from commercial banking. And then I will introduce you to the concept of green inclusive finance and show you also examples of products and services that are already in place. Third, and as this is not a new concept, I will share with you how are we standing on the shoulders of experts and the potential of harvesting from previous experiences? And I will close underlying the main challenges ahead where I'm sure you will say by the end, there we can take a bold action. Let's get started. So low income population have struggled for decades without access to financial services. And you know, we mentioned already, Professor Muhammad Yunus has been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006 for creating economic and social development from below. As a founder of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh has given the origins of the concept of microfinance. Microfinance is the provision of financial services to low income people. And it's characterized by the target population. It's low capital businesses, micro entrepreneurs, low income populations that are or excluded populations from commercial banking. The financial services such as credits are usually small and also in short loan cycles. And organizations have a large outreach reaching extreme rural remote areas with their loan officers as infrastructure reaching distant villages. That does not happen in the commercial banking. Here we see an example of a bank in Afghanistan and who have a close, also really a close relationship with their clients, visiting them, listening to their needs and facilitating access to services that before were not possible to have. Now, this can be financial services and also non-financial services, can be loans, saving accounts, macro insurance, even fund transfers or remittances, and even investments in infrastructure. And institutions can offer as well financial literacy, capacity building programs, and we coordinated with uh, local entities and other stakeholders, they can support even in legal reforms. How does the financial inclusion ecosystem look like? We have several types of organizations that offer microfinance services. We call them financial service providers and as well some commercial banks that recently have also increasing trends serving the base of the pyramid. But as well, we have some informal access to finance from family, friends, landlords, traders, loan sharks, money traders. And as you see out of the bubble from the microfinance services, besides microfinance, besides from providing financial services, microfinance serves to increase financial inclusion, but also to reduce the risk to fall into unpayable loan traps from informal shark lenders. Worldwide, there are more than 10,000 financial service providers with only uh, 1,000, a bit more than 1,000 microfinance institutions that were able before with mixed market that were able to report data on their activities and that have needs of financing and access to funds to meet the needs of their clients in the global south. Imagine also the, the rest of institutions that um, are not yet able to manage their data in order to report to report what they are doing. Now, let's get started on green inclusive finance. We are clear already on the landscape of inclusive finance. Now, let me introduce you to the word green in these services. Financial institutions can also provide 
products and services that help households and micro entrepreneurs to become more resilient to the effects of climate change. We see here some examples of services, but I'll like to share with you first the definition that we have been working with. It's green inclusive finance supports economic opportunities and attends the needs of households, the micro, small and medium enterprises that have been partially excluded by the standard banking sector with the main purpose of increasing resilience to climate change, mitigate adverse environmental impacts and also foster sustainability in the long term. An institution, let me uh, drive you how we get there. An institution can start defining a strategy, manage and monitor, monitor it over time, understand that as an institution, they can identify and manage their internal environmental impacts and also uh, the risk that they have by reducing the adverse impacts on the environment. Also, they can identify um, and also they can identify and manage the external environmental risks that they have by assessing the impacts of the activities they finance to their clients and understand what is the vulnerability that they have. And by identifying and managing this, offer products and services to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So how does this look? No, when it means that for each adversity, whether heavy rains or droughts, heat waves, fuel prices increase, electricity prices fluctuation, outages, lack of power sources, we can offer financial services and products that can build that climate resilience. We're talking about here solar crop dryers, macro insurance, reforestation, solar panels, biogas digesters, improved cook stoves, um, yes, yeah, solar lighting or solar systems and energy efficiency measures, all helping to build climate resilience. Green microfinance has been also promoted um, by different actors. Here I'm, I bring to you also some examples from um, um, microfinance investment vehicles that have supported microfinance institutions. For instance, ADA has um, promoted green microfinance and has helped organizations to offer renewable energy or energy efficiency, sustainable agriculture, eco-responsible housing, as well as water and sanitation offerings. And let's go through some examples. We don't see only financial services, but also non-financial ones, relief assistance to flood victims, tree planting programs, urban gardening for microfinance institution in Philippines, communication on how to prepare to emergencies or demo farms to show products to protect the client's agricultural activities. We see institutions offering loans for innovating for emergencies and for energy systems. And as well, institutions that when introducing new technologies, they accompany their clients with capacity building programs and workshops, introducing um, how these technologies work. As well, we see other type of institutions that when introducing a new program, green microfinance, they accompany the, their client in the, whole, in the whole process. They do awareness raising on climate change. They support the um, clients in searching for the clean energy suppliers and organic seeds, and as well um, on fertilizer suppliers and how to look for them. And then, uh, finally, to enable them access to microcredits. We see other more advanced that help fas uh, clients facilitating to estimate what is the investment that they need and the costs, and or others that are even uh, that have a larger uh, offerings that not only finance the clients but also the distributors of these technologies, and with a whole range of products to adapt to cleaner systems as well institutions as Annapurna that combine energy and water solutions, or even institutions that this one SAC Bank in Mongolia that offer services and products for climate change adaptation with sustainable agriculture practices and energy efficient measures, and as well mitigating climate change switching to clean, to clean energies. Finally, we also see examples of more complex and multidimensional solutions at all levels with microfinance institutions, as is the case of Fundacion BBVA, microfinance supporting their 
institutions in committing to water sanitation, energy efficiency, sustainable infrastructure, recycling, agriculture sustainability. So with all these examples, you will say we are already on the other side. Let's see where do we stand? How has the concept evolved and what's, what's next? So before, when I started in this, um, in this sector, we were talking about Microfinance Plus. Ma Microfinance Plus looking at um, this is something else that microfinance institutions could do. It started with uh, the origins with Grameen Shakti that launched the concept um, also supported by ITCOL in Bangladesh and has gained recognition. And we multiplied this concept of combining energy and microfinance. Then it was switched to support microenergy. And then by the beginning of last decade, we were talking already about green microfinance, that it has a larger scope. And then um, we also saw you now with MEBA, the um, possible offerings in climate smart finance and integrated also the concept climate smart. Now we're talking about green inclusive finance. Nowadays, we know that these are the steps. We know that first we define the environmental strategy, then we identify the environmental risk and opportunities, then we manage and finally supply. And this has, these steps have been um, the results of knowing what has been behind all these programs and has been also the concept that has built the tool Green Index 3.0 that gathers all the experiences and lessons learned from multiple stakeholders and programs. Who are these? So in the last decade, we have had several programs from ITCO, UNCDF, the Clean Start Program from ADA with the Ministry of Luxembourg, Green Growth, um, Green, growth, Green for Growth Fund, Cambio, Eco, Micro, MEBA, now the Scale for Resilience, the MEBA Biodiversity Platform, and many more programs supporting microfinance. We have as well multiple microfinance investment vehicles. Um, to mention here a few, few of them, it's only an excerpt, that have engaged in developing the sector, creating their own programs or joining efforts. And as well, we have seen several microfinance institutions around the world that have been piloting and upscaling the products and services. You can see more here in the database that we have gathered with microfinance institutions offering different types of products and loans. And this was not possible without the help of multiple organizations. As well, this is only an excerpt of the several organizations and institutions that have supported FSPs and IMIVs to bring their programs forward. Nowadays, we even have conferences on the subject gathering hundreds of participants and efforts of studies to further strengthen the sector. And these programs have brought us multiple and valuable lessons learned where nowadays and new initiatives can build upon. We have public policies, multiple stakeholders commitment, how the institutional investment should look like, the importance of promotion, not only to target rural, but also peri-urban urban products, conducting baseline data collection, have a look to the complexity um, of these programs, understanding what are the customer needs, collecting this data, uh, and gathering with partner partners, investing in the field staff, negotiating with suppliers that each one does their um, field of expertise. So with these lessons learned now, I'd like to close here this section today. Um, going into what are the challenges that we have and what are the ways forward. Microfinance institutions are highly motivated to develop the programs and products to reduce their exposure, not only of the institution, but also of their clients, offering lending products that can factor the climate and environmental risks. So far, we have over 300 microfinance institutions offering green inclusive finance, with an estimated number of loans of over 300,000, an estimated uh, amount is worth of 300 million of dollars. And this qualitative and quantitative information gives an overview of uh, what is the climate vulnerability. However, microfinance institutions still require both technical capacity and so softer financing terms and tools to develop financial products that are fit to invest in the environment microfinance institution can, in, 
can engage in multiple actions and also can they, they can offer a large um, scope of products and services that I have showed you before. And as well, they have now tools to track their efforts and learn what actions to take with tools developed for further developing the sector. From the data that we have gathered from the action group with over 1000 assessments in the past decade, we observed an increasing trend of institutions committing to protect their clients and their institutions. However, and in order to, more, to help more institutions, I will bring here some words from Pedro Marchetti from FDL Nicaragua. I hope if FDL is here. When talking two years ago um, uh, at the European Microfinance Platform, at the European Microfinance Week, he said, commercial banks are able to demonstrate easier their impact. However, microfinance institutions need support to manage their data and track their impact. But because only by doing this, we ensure that the services and offers can grow farther. farther. That means we need technical assistance for supporting institutions and organizations in managing their data, but also in tracking the impact that they are um, obtaining. Let's talk first about the technical assistance. These programs that look amazing with such an incredible offer of products and technologies for their clients wouldn't be possible to conduct without the help of organizations. In WASH or in renewable energy solutions, we have different actors as well for sustainable agriculture. We have seen the different um, organizations that are supporting with their programs to the institutions. And still the question remains, how can we measure the impact per dollar per investment? John Larrea, she said, and the most difficult evidence to come up with is the evidence on how transactions perform. Because with technology, to measure impact at household base, we can ensure that all stakeholders know what it means to improve livelihoods, and most importantly, how do they contribute? As time is the metric for runners, we strive for standard metrics for impact investment. And what about impact data management? International frameworks from the World Bank, from UN, from the FAO, help organizations to track same indicators worldwide so that no institution have to gather and develop the indicators from scratch, but talk a common language when everywhere, where everyone can say, this is the impact that I have brought to my communities. So that no matter the institution or its location, everybody knows what the supply of needs and the level of resiliency at household base look like. Impact data management can help institutions to track their clients' vulnerabilities. What happens, you know, how, how vulnerable are they to a drought, to a heat wave, to lacking of electricity, to a shortage in water supply. And therefore, when adversity comes, it doesn't become a puzzle without knowing where to start. Lamenting, why didn't we do enough before or where exactly people need help? But gladly, with tools and with the data management, identifying household per household, their situation, the technologies that they have or need, the sustainable practices that they have been disbursed, and what the impact has been. And then be sure that the efforts made with the clients, whether financial or not financial services, we ensure we have climate resilient communities with supporting institutions committed for their climate resiliency. We need help to make our case. You give me one dollar, here is your impact. Now it's your turn to take action. Thank you. <clears throat> wow, Natalia, thank you. Thank you for a very loaded with lots of information presentation. Um, and um, uh, uh, definitely setting the scene for what we will um, listen to and hear uh, over the next uh, over the next one hour one hour or so so um i would like at this point to hand over to my colleague isha isha sharma is working with us to and she's helping to bring together the questions that may come up and she will moderate this next few minutes for questions before we move on to uh, the next part of our agenda. So Isha, 
I would like to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Susan. And thank you for the very insightful um, keynote speech, Natalia, with the presentation. It was, I think it was the holistic mix of, you know, infotainment, very engaging, entertaining, but also very informative and very insightful and enlightening. And thank you, Francoise and uh, Sano as well for the very interesting perspective. And I think so far that we've come, uh, we've had a very interesting dimensions towards microfinance um, so far. So let's just dive into the questions we have. Um, so I've just collated them. So let's start from the first one by Paul. Uh, he asked in French, uh, I'll, I'll translate that into English. Um, so what are the strategies that civil society organizations can do to find the funds? Um, and I think either three, um, Natalia or Sano or Francoise, you're welcome to answer um, as you fit. But this was mainly during Natalia's session, so I think they're, they're mainly towards you, Natalia. <laughs> So in my in, in the decade of experience that I have been working with microfinance institutions and with several organizations, it is imperative for any organization to know what are the needs of their clients, um, what are the needs of their communities where they work, if they can dimension um, what is the market for a new product or for a new service, and what exactly do they need as an institution um, of funds or whether technical assistance, whether capacity building or whether um, a credit line or, um, or with a specific program so that they can help their clients. So the strategy first is knowing first your clients, gathering that data and be able to track that data in the, long, in the short and long term and ensure that there is a professional consistent, robust framework of the institution or of the organization where they can demonstrate that every dollar that will be put into that organization, into those efforts will, will have an impact and, and will reach the promises that the organization, whether civil, no, whether an NGO or a, or a, no, or a bank um, is targeting to. And second, um, identify who are the stakeholders that are working at national, at local level, national level, and also from experiences from uh, international actors that have also worked in the region. What were their uh, experiences, lessons learned? Are they coming back to that, to that area? Yes, no, or why? Um, are there synergies there to create and to further explore whether uh, are there programs where they can apply and if not, or what are the conditions and discuss also the conditions um, that have been put for those programs. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, Natalia. Um, I think next question would be more mainly to Jeff. Uh, Secretariat staff. Uh, so Robert asks us, how will the Jeff cushion known barriers? So maybe Flaz also answer this. Francoise is hello. Yes, or Susan. Sorry, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, Jason. Sure, I can come in. Um, oh. by the way, the sound has been cut, cutting out in and out um a little bit for the last uh, minute or so. How can the Jeff cushion the main? Oh, sorry uh, this is uh, Jason Spensley from the Se Jeff Secretariat. Uh, delighted to come in. The question I understand is how can the Jeff cushion the main barriers of access to microfinance? 
this will be a focus of the two panels that we that we have ahead. Um, suffice, that said, some of the key barriers that we are seeing are financial literacy of uh, local vulnerable populations, as well as um, uh, awareness and expertise on uh, of of uh, local producers, smallholder farmers, micro enterprises on the viable uh, productive solutions um, or options for climate resilience um, and nature positive activities. Uh, uh, so the delivery of that financial literacy as well as technical assistance and training, as well as technical assistance and training to the microfinance sector itself in the value of nature-based solutions, climate resilient productive activities, and how to incorporate th these um, into their lending practices um, and, and their um, financial valuation practices. Those are some of the key barriers that the Jeff have identified and are, and are supporting through some initial projects on green, green inclusive microfinance. Thanks, back to you. I'm, I'm, and just to say, I'm, we're, we're really looking forward to hearing from the panelists about their specific ex experiences in this area. May I take the floor? Um, let up, uh, Isha. Yeah, uh, sorry, Sana, we just have two more questions and then, uh, then we have another session uh, for, and then I guess if we have more time then we can see how to fit in. I'm going to try to club the questions um, since we have the next panel going on. Can you all hear me now? Because I think there was a broken voice from my end. Yes, we can, Isha. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that's great. Okay, so um, Natalia, uh, so I'm going to club Severin's and uh, Sano's questions together. Um, so I think it's mainly on, uh, sorry, Christine's your sound so, uh, okay isha we're having a problem i think this is about more about green microfinance so what could be a challenges am i breaking again for you yeah i'm sorry but the, the sound wasn't very good i didn't you already posed the question? Yes, there are two. Sorry, Isha is having a problem with her sound. So I will okay. ask, there are two questions. Uh, one is that what could be the major challenges faced by green microfinance institutions and what mechanisms have you used to address them? In addition, are there instances where microfinances offer grants or blend grants with loans? So that's one question from one person. I don't know if I should ask the other one. Um, uh, we have another uh, question from Sano where he's asking, what are the key elements to claim resilience? How to measure them? How many years are you working with this initiative? And please share one exam concrete example data and how can the community beneficiaries take lead in their risk reduction? and moving to resilience uh, and what makes it green or the rate of interest. So quite a bunch of questions together with that, uh, but I will let you answer those questions. Okay, um, I'll start with the challenges. Uh, micro, microfinance is like all these uh, examples that I showed, um, whether they have been supported by different parties with their expertise. They, most of the institutions, they don't do um, these programs alone. They go into models, two-hand models, where they can partner with NGOs or with uh, local expertise or with international partners as well with suppliers. Um, and, and therefore, there is always the need of until where does the institution, the microfinance institution goes and until where the NGO or the expert in the new practice, sustainable practice or the technology supplier or the um, capacity building campaign that, that will be implemented, who should take those 
not those leads and and who should advance and and there like the challenge is to have the support from uh, technical assistance or from programs where they can have the guidance for those that don't have any experience before on how to introduce this new product or how to intro to um yeah to develop a whole strategy that starts from management board uh and then convincing like all staff that despite the efforts that they have to engage um it is worth to do and this is connected then to the next question on claim you now how to claim resilience and that's that's what i was mentioning about um how to how to measure impact and how how do we know that um this products and services have um have achieved what what it was meant to do this this product and for this we need first information from the baseline um what are the vulnerabilities that the client has or that these communities have vulnerabilities towards climate change or to the, uh, or towards extreme events or towards um not not having the access to um, to affordable electricity or outages or the water supply, and then be able to collect that data in a standardized way so that it's possible to compare the data from institution in Philippines to another institution in Uganda or to another in Bolivia, and make sure that um, for each dollar invest, then um, we are helping to overcome the difficulties. Claim resilience means, means here, um, are we achieving to a level of minimum for the basic service? Are we, are we achieving to a min, uh, level of um, ensuring that those livelihoods are protected? I've been working uh, in the sector since, 2009, since 2010, accompanying multiple microfinance institutions also and uh, development, international development cooperation and energy suppliers in developing programs um, in order to, to provide these technologies in, um, in, in deprived areas. And since 2018, I've been working in EDERA, developing solutions for, um, for helping the institutions in managing their impact data and also to implement those services that gather exactly those, those frameworks. Uh, I, I can share with you data from ASCII, for instance, not the, the last one that we were uh, discussing on how they uh, were helping their clients. They have um, 113 clients over 82 branches, and they have counted um, more than 280,000 clients affected in provinces uh, due to climate change events and um, more than 35,000 clients that have been affected by natural disasters. And they have, um, over the period of time that, that they have been working in those areas since 2014, they have ensured uh, 675 clients so when we are talking about um, different types of offerings you now from microcredits it can be also microinsurance or capacity building campaigns or funds transfer and here for instance the case of ASCII has been in insurance other institutions um, that I have accompanied uh, have been disbursing loans for renewable energies and how it's tracked and measured resilience is how, how was the improvement in not changing from the kerosene lamp or uh, from the diesel expenses then to the solar, solar or clean energy technology that they are using. And the last question on what makes green in terms of interest rates, uh, it varies. Institutions, they can offer whether their normal interest rate for their energy loans, or they can 
not depending on on the support that they have, they can also provide interest rates that are at a lower level or lower interest rates um, than compared to their other offerings as a way also um, to show their, like not the, the advantages of those loans, but as well, uh, depending uh, on the support that they have. And I insist here on the value of data and impact tracking, because if it will be transparent, how a dollar or how an investment that is given to a microfinance institution, um, now what is the impact that they can reach in um, reach when transferring that fund or that technical assistance and compare it to the number of people that have been assisted or that they have enhanced their climate resiliency, then more funds will come. And yeah, that's, um, that's the main message that I, I would like to underline. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you very much, Natalia. Uh, could whoever is sharing the whiteboard please um, remove it? We would like to now move to the next stage of our uh, of, of, of our agenda. We are running 20 minutes behind time and we do have people who, oh, thank you, great. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, and we will now move over to our next stage of our, of our agenda. We do have, uh, uh, colleagues who are joining us where it's fairly late and so we would like to now I would like to now hand over for the next uh, stage to my colleague Avril Benchimor. Avril is a senior uh, climate uh, oh not, not climate sorry uh, Avril is um senior finance senior finance Senior Finance Coordinator, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Work, welcome, Avril. And, and just to inform everybody, we have shared a link to a brochure and you will find out uh, why as we go through this panel. Welcome, Avril. Thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Great. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Um, it is a real pleasure for me to be here with you today and to introduce and discuss the first panel of this technical session. Our panel will discuss some initiatives that have been led by regional CSOs and NGOs that tr are truly an example of creativity and also the power of grassroots initiatives in creating and protecting the local livelihoods. We will see three specific examples that have been originated by grants but that have created from these grants financial mechanisms that are inclusive, nature positive, and climate friendly, amongst other things and positive parts for the communities. Um, I would ask when the slides, so Regine, sorry to introduce my, uh, to interrupt my introduction, but I would ask for the slides when we're ready. Thank you, not, not yet. Um, so, these three examples, as I was mentioning, um, are brought today by three wonderful speakers, and I'm very honored to have them here with me today. First, we have Mr. Samuel Sia, project lead, sustainable. In, in, he is a project lead in a sustainable agroforestry initiative. We also have Mr. Jorge Martinez, community credit officer at Feeder Park, and we also have Gurav Meta founder and CEO of Dharma Life and its profit entity, Gajam. Welcome to the three of you. It's an honor for us to be here and to hear from you directly what you have managed to create with the help of the communities that you work with. I wanted to open this panel by asking to briefly introduce yourselves and letting us know, all the uh, listeners to this panel, how you came to work in these different, this different initiatives. So if I could please start with Jorge Martinez from Fidel Park.
Buenos días, buenas noches, buenas tardes. Un placer. Les saludamos desde Puriscal, Costa Rica. Eh, yo soy el coordinador de crédito de la Fundación Integral para el Desarrollo Rural del Pacífico Central, eh, FIDERPAC. Eh, efectivamente, mi nombre es Jorge Martínez Vargas y pues voy a contarles que eh, pues tuvimos la dicha de conocernos con eh, el programa de pequeñas donaciones porque pues eh, ellos han venido trabajando desde hace algún tiempo en esta zona de la cuenca de los ríos Jesús María y Barranca con proyectos relacionados eh, sobre minimizar el impacto ambiental y pues también eh, ellos conocían de nosotros porque Fiderpaque es una institución que tiene más de 35 años de estar trabajando en la zona del Pacífico Central de Costa Rica eh, y que pues por la experiencia que tiene y la credibilidad que tiene en lo que hace pues eh, se dieron cuenta de que nosotros podíamos ser un excelente socio colaborativo y entonces visualizamos que había básicamente como tres aspectos en los que podríamos eh, complementarnos con lo que ellos hacían y con lo que nosotros hacemos que básicamente es eh, que nosotros somos eh, una organización que eh, administra, eh, asesora, supervisa eh, y busca fondeo para un modelo de crédito comunal que ya tiene, como les decía, desde la década de los 80, eh, su existencia acá. Se empezó con un plan piloto en dos comunidades rurales y a la fecha pues, se cuenta con 100 comités de crédito comunales en más de 350 comunidades que albergan a 100, o, o más bien cobijan a más de 350 comunidades. Básicamente la idea era eh, bueno, que pudiéramos expandir a otra zona o a otra área eso, esa posibilidad de, de que esas comunidades contaran también con el servicio crediticio eh, como un complemento a las actividades que ya los pobladores de esa zona pues llevaban, ¿verdad? Y eh, pues básicamente poder eh, transmitir la experiencia que teníamos y esa eh, capacidad que tiene la institución, que tiene FIDERPAC, de, eh, sobre la experiencia que tienen las personas, ¿verdad? Y sus, sus capacidades, pues fortalecerlas y ampliarlas y pues generar eh, en esa conciencia que se genera a través de la unión de las personas, poder llevar a esta zona de estas cuencas de río... Eh, de Jesús María y de, de Barranca, pues eh, expandir nuestra, nuestra posibilidad. Y así fue entonces cómo se logró eh, establecer este proyecto que se llama Microcréditos para la Producción Sostenible en las cuencas de Río Jesús y Barranca. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much for this introduction, Jorge. We can't wait to hear how you basically complemented what was needed from the communities with the credit schemes that you have created. We will get into that um, in the next question. Next, I have Samuel, please. If you could introduce yourself and say how you came to work in this initiative. Thank you very much, Evel. <clears throat> My name is Sam Insea from Ghana. So I'm the project lead, basically project manager for nonprofit organization, Sustainable Agroforestry Initiative. So me growing up as a, as a local person also from, from a rural community where access to many government institutions, even going to school, you have to walk maybe 10 kilometers. So I realized, you know, as a community member, we understand our socioeconomic and environmental challenges. So uh, Sustainable Agroforestry Initiatives was created to bring responsible resource management that have plagued in our rural communities. So now we're working in an area solving critical challenge about energy. So many women use energy for cooking or most homes use energy for cooking, which is basically from wood energy. And the result has been massive landscape degradation. So if you look at a deforestation in our part of area we are working in, it's mostly cutting trees from the vegetation, any tree, and then convert you know, through traditional means to solve the, the energy needs. So, our goal is to work with the rural communities to solve the energy issue while also create economic benefit for them. So that has been my passion, my interest, and we are working with the rural villages in our part of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam, for uh, 
for your introduction and we will get to your agroforestry model and the various innovations you've, you've brought to that area of the world. And last but not least, uh, my dear friend and CEO of Dharma Life, Gurav, please. Yeah, thanks, Avril. So um, I run a social enterprise called Dharma Life and um, we're working on um, creating a women entrepreneur network which focuses on climate change and uh, energy access in rural India. My previous background is uh, I was an investment banker and a private equity professional for six, seven years of my life, then went through a personal episode, which I luckily survived, and then decided to change my life and move to India to try to make a difference on uh, basically people and planet, trying to create livelihoods and impacting um, the environment and uh, the planet. So um, what we do is we have a network of women entrepreneurs who work in rural villages in India. We have 17,000 of them who impact about 50,000 villages and create awareness around um, around climate issues, sell social impact products, um, both for households as well as for micro businesses uh, to reduce climate footprints at the village level. These are then financed uh, and, um, and through that we're creating our impact um, and uh, we also promote uh, conservation practices. Uh, so that's a brief background. We have impacted more than uh, 10, uh, 12 million people so far. Thank you. Thank you, Gurav. Um, thank you all of our panelists to be here uh, with us today. We now wanted to get into a little bit more detail so that our um, audience can see visually, but also hearing from you directly, what you've been working on in the last years and the great achievements that have been uh, that have resulted from the initiative. So I'm going to ask first, Rafa, sorry, Sam, uh, to start with the uh, financial mechanism that you came to create. And for that, I'm going to ask Re Reggio, the Jeff Secretariat, to share the slides, please, in the screen. Can you go to the green slide? Um, next. Next. This one. Thank you. Sam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I'll basically talk about the project we are doing and how you know our model of financial inclusivity, you know, how support, you know, creates sustainability for our target or our goal or our outcomes we are trying to achieve in our part of the world. So the main goal, like I said, we created sustainable agroforestry initiative to solve environmental challenges that are, you know, characterized in our villages and our communities. So that's our main goal, you know, climate change, resilience, biodiversity conservation, while also creating economic venture. And what we are doing now is using wood energy as a model. Like I said, wood energy over all over the world has, you know, demand because there's increasing population and in Ghana the demand for charcoal has been exponential increasing every year because there's no high prices of gas and other kind of you know renewable energies so I'll talk about the current system that they used to convert into uh, the charcoal production and I'll talk about model and also talk just about how our financial inclusivity model has supported the project so the right the top left corner is the current production system. So that's how wood energy is being done presently. And that's what we are trying to solve. So every tree on the vegetation, it's more like opportunistic. Even me growing up, I've used that model. If I need money to buy shoes or shirt, I'll just grab any tree I found on the landscape, cut them, put soil on it, you know, burn, and then get a charcoal and sell on the roadside. So this is typical and it's ongoing. So every, lands, every tree on the landscape is being cut. So they cut the trees and mainly it's by the women because they are mostly affected by energy demands in the house. So they cut the trees, if you look at the arrow, chop them into bits or pieces, you cover it with the soil, and then you set a fire into that. And the consequences has been like scale deforestation. And also like the fire, because the fire is uncontrolled. You have to travel all the way, maybe five kilometers to your production site in the bush, by the time you get there, everything is banned. And this is the challenge that is called environmental degradation and the biodiversity issue we are facing in the black water landscape. And so our model is to help you solve the deforestation by cutting trees for fuel. 
while also you know, increase the uh, landscape resilient to climate change and provide economic benefit and for the people that have been affected. So that's how our project model came to. So if you look at the bottom left also, that's our model project. So now instead of cutting trees from the landscape or any vegetation you get, we are encouraging the communities to grow their own nursery, establish their own nursery, establish their own plantations that will be grown and used for the charcoal production. We are transitioning them from land, cutting trees from the land and growing their own source of wood for energy. And like I said, the method has been traditional method, F mount method, you cut the trees, dig the hole, put the trees in there and cover with the soil and some leaves and set fire. We are transitioning them by providing them the kiln technology where they can control and the access or the wastage is reduced and you get like larger, larger efficiency from your technology and then you convert that into the charcoal. So that has been our approach and we are working with uh, the, the village you know, women. So we started this project and the project is going and our main model is like the financial inclusivity aspect. Hello, participants. Hello. Could you all mute yourselves? Sam, um, we need to unmute yourself so we can continue. Thank you. Good, yes, because somebody was, you know, unmuted and distracting. Good, so that has been our approach. We're trying to solve the deforestation, the biodiversity degradation that has characterized our landscape. And by using like a, this modern approach of supporting the communities to grow their own nursery, establish their own plantation, using kiln technology to convert it and produce the charcoal. And our goal is to do like the eco certification where we can sell our charcoal even in outlets. We are getting this in progress. And we started with about 100 communities, like 100 people, and I've expanded into more. And I see the success is from our financial inclusivity model that we introduced. We understand the SGP money we get. So we are working under OP6, OP7. It's more like a startup. So we use that as a basis to introduction of the project into the villages. So now what we do that's how do you maintain or keep the sustainability and the momentum of the villages? Because project lifespan is too short and the financial you know uh, startup is not there probably like two years you know the project is ended but we want to continue and get a larger impact and solve the, the the challenges that we are facing while creating the economic benefit so we introduced a model called village savings scheme so this is where you know our financial capacity for the villages or the community came through we registered the community members into groups maybe five, 10, 20, depending, and then set up like an informal cooperative for them. We registered, we registered them with a government institution and some kind of financial institution, like a, the local village, you don't have banks, but you can get like a micro financial institution. Because the whole goal is to have them get a savings account where we taught them, you know, the benefit of saving. So the agreement we made from the villages or the people that are working is that, now you produce your charcoal. We know we need to replace the cane someday. We know we need to expand the plantation someday. We need to raise the energy. How do we keep that going? So we agree on 10% from your production, we donate into this savings account, which belongs to the community people. Our goal as a nonprofit organization is to support them to be economic resilient, whilst our target is to reduce the deforestation and biodiversity issue. So that's our target. But then how do you go that? So that's where the village savings scheme came through. So when we work a little while with this village savings approach, we realize we are making money. And then a lot of people are coming through because they see the real benefit on the ground. So how do we do that? Then we decided to also introduce another model called contract farming. No, so the farmers, the small scale farmers are also farmers. They are growing trees for energy. We need to maximize the productivity of the landscape. So what we do is that we have to integrate the planting size with food crops. But the community, the average size, farm size, they do is like 0.5 of an acre because they don't have money to buy seeds, other farming input. So the village savings scheme we created and the money we are getting from that, 
we leverage that by buying like improved seeds for whoever is interested that will integrate that into the planting size. So once we do that, we go into the agreement. I said, non-profit organization, we will help them to market the produce. So they're growing something like maize, granuts, cowpea, bambara beans. So once we leverage that for them to produce, we buy that product harvest from them. And then we will save that when they say more market or more price in the market, you sell that. And that money become part of the savings scheme because we are just saving it to increase, you know, the portfolio because there are larger interests of people coming. How do we sustain the project also for a longer term? So that's what we are doing right now. And now we are also moving to another frontiers because now we realize that like, more people are coming, they are making money from the village saving, we're expanding to the contract farming. What other economic activities can we also introduce? So this is where people are okay, we are interested in beekeeping. So then if you are interested in beekeeping, we register you, we set up an account for you and we support you, we leverage that from the funds we're able to generate from the village saving, the contract farming for them. And now if the communities are going into the community food storage facility, because post service losses is a major issue and the community don't have money to build that. So through small grant approach as a startup, and we set up the village saving scheme, which expanded to contract farming. Now we are leveraging that to also expand into community food storage, where they can build few silos and they can keep their crops and they can sell it when there's a market. So Thank like you. I said, good. Sorry, Sorry <laughs> just that, your conclusion so that we can uh, keep in good. with the times of the pandemic. Excellent. So now like our goal, as I'll talk about the outcome. So we started with 100 farmers. Now we're expanding to about 1,800. We started with no money in the village savings, able to generate about equivalent of 20,000. We are increasing food security and diversity, diversification by intercropping the food crops. The adoption of the cane technology has reduced the wastage and then the drive from the traditional method. And our goal is to the land base. So we're able to even restore 100 hectares and it's expanding and increasing. And through wildfire prevention, we also promote the natural regeneration of the land base given our own goal of environmental conservation. That's our target. And then we're achieving that through this financial inclusivity. Thank you very much and I appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you, Sam. It's a lot to uh, go over from, as you said, and I will keep some remarks for the end, but as you said, what could be sparked with a startup, with a grant that to make sustainable, you started new financial mechanisms that resulted in like not only giving $1, but a dollar or one, uh, 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 one local currency unit, but it's when you start rotating and making, putting it to work for productive purposes and having the community involved, how that can be spread, grown and get these uh, results. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. I would like now to go to uh, Gura for the next slide. So thank you. Yeah, sure. So. Um... Our operating model is we have um, we recruit women entrepreneurs at the village level. Uh, these are women who normally don't have, I mean, who are first time entrepreneurs mostly. Sometimes the family has some income. Uh, once we recruit them, we train them and digitally empower them. Um, so they are able to operate a smartphone, work on apps, etc. And they also, you know, build the confidence to go outside of the house, which is quite often a challenge in rural India. Um, and then um, once they're trained, we actually ask them to work on behavior change programs. Uh, so for example, on the energy access and, uh, or you know, kind of climate change side, we work with them on changing the behavior of the community to use um, kerosene lights and moving them to solar lights, uh, moving, changing the cooking practices from open fire cooking to um, using clean cook stoves or induction cooktops, electric cooking devices, uh, and also among other kind of uh, Another example would be we will get them to approach um, farmer producer organizations or small farmers to change their uh, methods towards more climate friendly methods, for example, using a solar dryer, solar water pump, etc. So the entrepreneurs inside their community identify um, target households and micro businesses, they then create, they run behavior change communication campaigns with them. Uh, then after that first level of sensitization and behavior change is done, um, the third step is to work on, um, on in providing the solution. So we have a supply chain which delivers the product uh, to the last mile, uh, to the whenever there is a demand. 
Um, so at the doorstep of the entrepreneur or, or the micro business then who where we install it directly, the entrepreneur is engaged in you know, guiding the household or the micro business in terms of setting up the device or using it, as well as um, this is done through apps where we submit videos uh, to them, if they just uh, to aid them in the process. And after setting up and starting, um, they um, also are able to manage any after sales complaints, which is quite often a problem. Um, and uh, that finally, the point is uh, this equipment has to be financed. So here we partner with microfinance institutions to provide the loan um, or um, normally the problem is microfinance institutions do not cover the whole village. So typically it's 10 to 15%. So there's quite often people or households or businesses who are not able to be you know, covered under microfinance uh, funding or financing financial loans, uh, or they may not be able to um, cover the interest costs because sometimes the ROI is not as positive. Uh, so in those cases, then we try to provide the loan ourselves. Uh, we have raised money from uh, from financial institutions to do this on, which are basically payments on installments, or we go to rural regional banks. So there's various options here, but there's a clear importance of this financial linkage, um, which is required. After, um, so that's that's the model, and uh, so we basically generate revenue uh, through this uh, these activities. So we retain a margin. We get paid uh, in our uh, through, with, from foundations or corporates for the behavior change programs. So we have, you know, utilized an ARP results-based financing framework uh, for that. Um, we have launched a facility for one of the categories, for example, now. And then uh, that payout obviously depends on the impact achieved quite often, right? So on the left side of the circle, you see, you know, kind of how the impact measurement through technology is kind of uh, essential for the payouts. And finally, I think we are scaling this through, scaling up the entrepreneur network um, and, um, just to sum it up, I think the impact we have achieved is around, um, you can see it on the left, 128,000 tons of CO2 saved, 1 million households reached, and 255,000 solutions disseminated um, at the rural uh, level in India. Um, and uh, this financial structure, so we are a foundation-owned social enterprise, we generate revenue, uh, but um, we reinvest it because at the ownership of the social enterprise is a foundation. So that's a brief summary of our financial model. Thank you very much, Gurab. This is very impressive in, in numbers. And, um, you know, what, what's really striking is the power of the communications campaign, how women entrepreneur with the help of technology for sure can help change the behavior at local level in the rural communities and how, you know, to reach scale. There's up to a point where microfinance institutions can come down. Probably they have their own challenges that we've heard from Natalia earlier on, on designing the products that are good enough for the communities. And it would be good to explore these type of questions in the second panel and we will get there, but, but thank you very much. And um, we will have uh, now Jorge explaining the first two slides. So if you could go back on the slides to the first two slides so that Jorge can explain the credit community community uh, model. Jorge, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I feel very pleased to be able to tell you how this works that we call the Communal Model of Credit. And as I told you earlier, it has its origins in the decade of the 80s. And the project starts with a plan pilot sustentado en que los productores de las zonas rurales siempre van a tener necesidades, llámese acceso a los centros de población, llámese agua potable, eh, educación y obviamente en los temas productivos. Entonces, este modelo fue tan exitoso que pues en el año 16, ya habiendo empezado en la década de los 80 con dos eh, comunidades, eh, ya teníamos eh, el modelo conformado por 80 comités de crédito. Entonces, también eh, les decía que para el año 2016, pues hicimos contacto o viceversa con eh, pequeñas donaciones, ¿verdad? Y pues vimos la posibilidad de replicar esta experiencia en esta zona de las cuencas de los ríos Jesús María y Barranca, entendiendo también que es una zona que estaba siendo afectada o es afectada por temas de degradación ambiental. 
Y pues, ¿cómo podíamos encajar nosotros ahí? Bueno, pues porque la experiencia nos decía que tenemos eh, la propiedad para eh, incidir en las personas y que ellos eh, entiendan, identifiquen cuáles son sus necesidades y sobre esas necesidades, después de priorizarlas, pues saber que si las personas están bien y sus familias están bien, pues el cerebro va a estar más oxigenado también para dar espacio a pensar en que yo también no solo tengo que estar atendiendo mis necesidades básicas, sino cuando ya me siento eh, un poco más relajado y que estoy satisfaciendo mis necesidades básicas, pues puedo empezar también a incidir positivamente en el ambiente. Y entonces creo que eh, en eso es lo que nos hemos eh, abocado a trabajar y queríamos hacerlo también en este nuevo proyecto, ¿verdad? Y entonces, ¿cómo funciona esto? Bueno, una vez que los vecinos de las comunidades, los pobladores, identifican cuáles son sus necesidades, FIDERPAC eh, trabaja con ellos en procesos de capacitación, en organización comunal, eh, apoyándose en las capacidades que tienen las personas, ¿verdad?, fortaleciéndolas y ampliándolas. Y entonces, una vez que las personas determinan que no es individualmente como pueden salir de sus necesidades, sino que es en forma grupal, solidaria y de forma empática, pues después de llevar a cabo en una comunidad todo un proceso de capacitación, los vecinos logran de, conformarse, ¿verdad? Y eh, Después de eh, establecer una asamblea comunal, eh, eligen a las personas de manera democrática para que asuma la administración de lo que denominamos Comité de Crédito Comunal y que eh, va a recibir eh, un fondo para ser administrado. Y entonces es esa, ese grupo de personas... Eh, como órgano colegiado, como junta directiva, quienes de ahora en adelante van a ser los encargados de seleccionar a los clientes o a los beneficiarios eh, que van a obtener un crédito para pequeños proyectos productivos. Y entonces también pues, puede ser posible que algunos no encajen en ese modelo y los directivos podrían decir que con base en las características de esas personas sustentado en valores, en principios y también en su posibilidad de pagar, eh, pues les aceptan su solicitud de crédito y les aprueban un préstamo. Y también, pues, eh, tienen que encargarse de recuperar los dineros que han, dado, que han sido dados en calidad de préstamo, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, esa mecánica hace que el círculo eh, vaya avanzando. ¿Por qué? Porque en la medida en que funcione bien un comité de crédito, eso hace que los recursos que surgen de esta actividad comunal, pues puedan ser eh, nuevamente utilizados para financiar a nuevos vecinos, a nuevos pobladores, a personas que necesiten del crédito para llevar a cabo eh, o ampliar o fortalecer sus proyectos productivos, ¿verdad? Y entonces, Toda esta dinámica va haciendo posible que se geste eh, toda una organización comunal alrededor del comité de crédito, ¿verdad? Y entonces las personas empiezan a identificar y con base en la capacitación que se da, pues ellos al final, después de ser únicamente clientes, pues terminan incluso siendo administradores, ¿verdad? Y la idea es que se vaya refrescando o se vaya nuevamente reestructurando la parte administrativa para que no sean siempre las mismas personas, sino que haya una dinámica de participación donde no solo actúo utilitariamente como cliente, sino que también me siento dueño y parte de esta organización que se llama Comité de Crédito Comunal y pues hace posible la sostenibilidad de este modelo de crédito. Y entonces pues en este nuevo proyecto logramos sumar 10 eh, comunidades más donde se establecieron eh, nuevos proyectos y se sumaron a este modelo de crédito y posteriormente pues eh, vinieron eh, otras comunidades más y en este momento el modelo de crédito está conformado por 10 comités de crédito comunales y que todos juntos 
son los que logran darle sentido y dirección a esta organización que funciona bajo el modelo de fundación, ¿verdad? Entonces, ¿qué es eh, una modalidad de organización sin fines de lucro y donde lo que esperamos es que todos los recursos sean reinvertidos para tener la capacidad de seguir avanzando y volver a llegar nuevamente a identificar nuevas comunidades que tengan nuevas necesidades y poder ampliar ese modelo, ¿verdad? Con la experiencia, con la buena experiencia eh, que se tiene de que son las mismas personas que si se organizan y estructuran eh, lo, la forma de trabajar, pueden ayudarse mutuamente a solventar los recursos. Y si pudiéramos ver la segunda lámina. Next slide, please. Tenemos otra laminita ahí para continuar. Yes, Reggie, please. Thank you. ¿Verdad? Eh, sobre específicamente el impacto del proyecto a mayo del 2022. Les decía que el proyecto eh, fue denominado Microcréditos para la Producción Sostenible en las cuentas del río Jesús María y el río Barranca, ¿verdad? Este proyecto dio inicio eh, o ya empezó su operatividad en septiembre del año 2016 y fue finalizando en marzo del año 2018. Eh, como les decía, el proyecto efectivamente logró concretarse en todos sus extremos y se logró consolidar, conformar 10 comités de, créditos, eh, de crédito más. El capital semilla original que, brindó, eh, el, eh, que se brindó para el proyecto fue de 120 mil dólares y a la fecha eh, ha permitido la colocación de recursos por... 613.154,46 dólares y en este momento esos comités de crédito en conjunto manejan una cartera de créditos por 475.741,31 eh, logrando que se beneficien 509 familias eh, y lo más importante acá es el impacto que logramos también tener sobre eh, las mujeres que de esos eh, créditos que se han dado eh, 214 han sido dirigidos hacia mujeres, ¿verdad? Y si podemos ver un poquitín ahí más abajo, pues básicamente para qué han sido destinados los recursos que las personas piden en calidad de préstamo. Bueno, tenemos que de ellos 109 han sido eh, utilizados para proyectos agrícolas, eh, 69 han sido utilizados para actividades pecuarias, 79 para... Eh, Actividades eh, de servicio, 108 para actividades de comercio y 148 para actividades de eh, capital de trabajo, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, podríamos decir que gracias a esta alianza, ¿verdad? Que logramos tener con el programa de pequeñas donaciones, pues logramos eh, impactar a una región que no contaba con con esta eh, modalidad de organización y con base en nuestra experiencia llegamos a las personas sabiendo que FIDERPAC no es el protagonista de esto, sino que son las mismas personas de las comunidades y que nosotros lo que hacemos es apoyarnos en las capacidades y las experiencias que tienen las personas y pues eh, hacerles creer que juntos podemos resolver los problemas y que esto es más fácil si sí, intentamos hacerlo individualmente. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Jorge. So, thank you, thank you to the three panelists. We can stop the uh, slide sharing. Um, and uh, I had a third round of questions, but I also see that there is uh, some, there are some hands up in the audience. So I'm gonna cut short from the third action, a, a question that I have for my panelists to give room to the audience uh, to interact with our panelists and share their questions. I just would like before I do that to just recap uh, the key common messages that I've heard in the, from the three participants. Uh, first is that when financial mechanisms, when they work well, they can be reutilized and increase their impact in several productive uses instead of using in one only 
uh, uh, use that the grant or an instrument more like the grant would just have a beginning and the end. The second and very important is the local ownership and the local dynamics. In Gaurav's example, that was led by women entrepreneur, community campaigns and the ownership that this has at community level, without it, this model wouldn't, wouldn't really work. And the same goes for Sam's example, in which the sharing at local level and going beyond the first use of the savings schemes to then going to the uh, supply type of contracts and then to additional uh, economic activities all start from the ownership and the lead of the local communities. And fin finally, I would also want to share uh, that there is the need from CSOs, NGOs, and the local communities for financial services beyond loans. This can be uh, a savings account, this can be other types of, of financial literacy, technical assistance, but that it can be a long way if we partner and we hear and we start with the needs, which I think was a point made by, by Natalia earlier on what the community needs before we design the financial products and services so they can serve the community needs. And with that common themes, I wanted to open for discussion and I see uh, the council member from Cote d'Ivoire who would like to intervene. Merci de me de me passer la parole. Comme il y a la traduction, a bien suivi le début. Mais je trouve que c'est un système très intéressant. Et je voudrais savoir si le programme de microfinancement va travailler désormais avec les organismes de microfinancement. Ça, c'est la première question. J'ai eu une expérience avec les organismes de microfinancement qui ont souvent des problèmes de recouvrement et qui ont également des problèmes de trésorerie. Et je pense que ce serait un risque de s'engager avec les organismes de microfinancement. Par contre, la présentation de FIDEPAC est malgré parce que cette présentation est basée sur l'approche communautaire. Et cette approche communautaire je pense serait plus approprié avec euh, l'approche du AGP, du microfem. Je voudrais poser une question à, à Georges et Martinez. Est-ce que avec cette approche communautaire, ils ont des liens avec les structures financières de leur pays? Merci. Thank you. I, I will respond to this uh, question and, and give the floor to Jorge as well, since uh, Alimata was asking a question directly to him. So on the way and on the clarification. Claro, con gusto. Gracias. Sí, con the, mucho gusto. Sí. ¿Puedo on, responder? Un momento. Voy a, tra voy a responder a la primera pregunta que tenía la señora Alimata y después le doy la palabra a Jorge. Okay, so on the uh, on the organism uh, on the on the fact that we're going to work at, with the microfinance institutions and how we're going to do that, the two the whole CSO event of today and the two sessions that we have organized the two panels are to define how we will like to engage as you were using uh, that word alimata with microfinance institutions. This is an open discussion and we're here to hear of your reaction. So it's very good that you share with us that you uh, have some concerns about the financial health of microfinance institutions in your country. So we take that and I think we will explore uh, 
different ways of how to use this second window of the SGP moving forward. We are not set yet on how we're gonna engage with the MFIs. On the second question for Fidel Pak, um, Jorge, if you want to come in, solo, solo saber si le llegó la traducción de la, de la pregunta, Jorge. Sí, claro, con todo gusto. Bueno, eh, específicamente con el proyecto, con este proyecto de pequeñas donaciones, eh, vamos a decir dos cosas que son básicas. Cuando llegamos a la, a la zona, nos encontramos básicamente que había una cultura muy arraigada en algunos de los pobladores en el tema de la regalía. Entonces, el grave problema es que muchas personas esperan recibir el pescado. Eh, nosotros con los recursos que recibimos eh, no los queremos eh, dar como pescados, queremos dar cañas de pescar. Entonces, ¿cómo es que funciona esto? Esto funciona en que, primero que todo, con respecto al eh, Comité de Crédito Comunal, él tiene que ser sostenible en el tiempo. Y entonces, cuando los clientes, usuarios o beneficiarios se dan cuenta de que tienen que cuidar lo que tienen ahí, porque resulta que después de tocar puertas en la banca tradicional, no existe esa posibilidad. Entonces, yo eh, empiezo a identificarme paulatinamente con el, con el comité de crédito y me doy cuenta que tengo que ser un buen pagador, porque en la medida en que soy un buen pagador, voy a lograr que el comité sea sostenible en el tiempo. Y por eso es que podemos decir que hay comités de créditos que tienen más de 36 años de existir. Y, y, y cuando tenemos a jóvenes que no habían nacido en ese tiempo y que en este momento están usando el crédito, es porque sus padres y sus abuelos pues les dijeron que había que eh, cuidarlo. Y de hecho, FIDEPAC en algunos momentos ha sido premiada o galardonada por esa capacidad que tiene pues de... Eh, manejar adecuadamente su cartera crediticia, ¿verdad? Y su cartera en riesgo. Y entonces, pero al final son las mismas personas las que lo hacen. Entonces, podríamos decir que realmente el éxito de este modelo es que la gente logre multiplicar lo que se le da, ¿verdad? Entonces, eh, yo puedo con toda firmeza decirles que el éxito que ha tenido este modelo de crédito a través de los años, es que las personas entienden que únicamente de manera solidaria y entendiendo que el comité de crédito les pertenece, ¿verdad? Van a garantizar que convirtiéndose en buenos pagadores van a poder multiplicar lo que tienen. Y entonces, posiblemente, en el tiempo, el patrimonio inicial que tenían, que era un capital semilla, se ha multiplicado eh, Tremendamente, ¿verdad? Entonces, eso da posibilidad a poder darle acceso a nuevas personas que se incorporan o van llegando al comité. Muchas gracias, Jorge. Thank you very much. I saw another uh, hand up from Severin. Yes, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much uh, for uh, for giving me a uh, floor here. Uh, I'm indigenous people. Uh, I am indigenous people from Burundi. I'm also focal point in a, a small grant program in UNDP for uh, global environment facility. Uh, my issue here, I want to raise here, is about how indigenous people uh, could have access to the GIF fund because uh, some activities in Africa, I see, I don't see indicators of indigenous people how uh, could be involved. They are not involved in, it, in it, the program, even though uh, global environment facility have a policy, a good policy, uh, integrating indigenous people. Uh, now, what I propose now is to set up a new mechanism 
of redress of redressing these issues because uh, from uh, a long time I was a focal point within a global ambient facility. I don't see any any project uh, which project are in the management of indigenous people. We have uh, many organizations here in Burundi. We have uh, many organizations in Africa, but I don't see the involvement. What uh, uh, I could propose here, it's very easy. Uh, at the Washington, uh, you could manage how I could do uh, you could collaborate directly with indigenous people organizations. It could be added the value because here uh, the manager, uh, coordinator of uh, the unity uh, of small grant program, don't understand how indigenous people, the role indigenous people, because in food security, in management forest project, uh, many indigenous people are in extreme poverty caused by the impact of climate change. That is the issue that I, have, I want to raise here, how GIF could manage a new policy for directly to work with indigenous people without intermediate between uh, other organisms because we see we are in extreme poverty about financial. The second point is about how we could do central to, to make a decentralization of financial flowers. Because it seems that the financial is concentrated, concentrated in, in, in other out of Africa. It's very, 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 very important to how to, to make a concentration about financial in a small grant and also how could you give the low ones, low ones source is also important for indigenous people to, to raise the income because income is very, very important. It could survive indigenous people in, in well-being, in, in scholarization for children, in food security. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Severin. Um, I'm not sure if any colleague of EPO would like to come in here related to the policy on Indigenous communities and the concerns raised by Mr. Sindize. If not, what I can what I can say is that we take note of the suggestion and that we bring also to your attention that we are opening up the small grant programs to other agencies in JFAIT. So there will be other agencies that could be closer or understand better um, the reality of the communities you are referring. Um, and, and maybe, yes, I don't know if someone came in. I know, Avril, if, if it helps, um, I, uh, this is Yoko Watanabe from the small grants program. And sure. just briefly, maybe I can clarify that uh, in the small grants program, Indigenous people is really the center and primary uh, partner that we have been working with. And the recent publication that we announced at the um, CSO consultation meeting last time on the Indigenous people's portfolio shows that uh, over 20% of our portfolio, meaning 20 7,000 project we supported that 25% uh, or so actually is uh, directly um, engaging with Indigenous peoples and working closely. And we have been working on ICCA, which is Indigenous Community Conserved Areas, um, Indigenous Peoples Fellowship, um, many capacity building initiative on food security and waste management and many more. And um, in Burundi, we, we currently have a vacancy for um, our national coordinator and a new person is coming in. 
and I'm sure the um, activities with indigenous people will be further um, enhanced and increased in this area. But uh, looking at your neighboring countries like Tanzania and South Africa and many, we have a really strong program with indigenous people and we really look forward to uh, working with you further. Thank you, Yoko. Thank you for this intervention and clarification. Um, I don't know if Gabriela would like to come in and then before I close, since we, we are a bit late, I could come in just quickly to answer that question. I'm Gabriella from the JEFSEC. I think it was really great that you uh, raised this issue. And as you know, the JEF has actually a very long history of working with indigenous peoples and local communities. And you, you highlighted yourself that we have a new policy and framework that really ensures the engagement with the indigenous peoples early in the project design of projects. As well, we have in, in on, in addition to these, we of course also have other activities. We have, for example, the Inclusive uh, Conservation Initiative that is a, a financing uh, program, a program, a project that is directly financing civil society, uh, indigenous people's communities. So we have a lot of, of background in this and we're very much looking forward to as we are pushing forward with the new uh, Small Grants Program 2.0 in DEF 8 to even further uh, strengthen and support indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriela. And um, we're running now uh, a bit late, so I'm gonna ask for the forgiveness of Fatima Aziz. Fatima, if you would like to write your uh, question in the chat, we will try to respond to it. Um, and I will close this panel just by, I think, uh, bringing back a reflection from Jorge, which is uh, that financial services beyond the grant can be like a fishing rod. We are not here only to give the fish, but also to help the people have their own fishing rods and, and uh, find their own uh, means their own ownership of their ways or their means of living and financial services through communal credit or microfinance institutions as we're going to see in panel two can be a solution for this. Thank you. Thank you so much Avril for uh facilitate moderating a really interesting session and and thank you too for the opportunity for participants to interact as always with these meetings uh time just seems to get away with us and i we see you fatima and mohammed amin uh we will come back to you at the end when we have a, a moment we would like to move into the next session but before we do that as you have all noticed to round off this session uh we have shared with you the the brochure and I would like to ask uh, Yoko two minutes to just talk about this to provide more information and then we can move to this next session. Yoko. Thank you so much, Susan, and dear colleagues and friends and distinguished participants. It is really a pleasure to join you today at the Jeff CSO consultation meeting on this inclusive microfinancing and launch together this Jeff Small Grants Program new brochure on microfinancing and um, MSMEs, the micro, small and medium enterprises as a way to share the knowledge and our experience so far in the area. The book, um, the brochure that uh, has been uh, launched is shown in my back and also the link is shown in the chat box. And the publication provides a brief introduction and just a snapshot of SGP's current work with private sector, particularly on our experience with microfinancing and MSMEs. And as you heard already from our great colleagues, Jorge on the Costa Rica experience and Ghana experience from Samuel, there's been a really great progress being made by our partners and grantees of the Small Grants Program in this area of work. And we're really um, looking forward to enhancing and scaling up this. And as we know, private sector is a key partner in achieving the sustainable development goals. And as they are well placed to develop and promote innovative solutions for development and environmental challenges, they are also unparalleled reach and capacity to see these solutions widely. 
And we really look forward to seeing that this partnership between government and civil society and stakeholder will be furthered. And as we know, SM MSMEs is about 90% of the businesses um, sector and more than 50% of the employment globally. And we really see that uh, working with this sector really is important for furthering um, and addressing the global environmental issues. And the small grants program facilitates partnership um, between the CSOs and governments and also scale up the sustainability and also community led initiatives through these work. Um, as you know, Small Grants Program is a corporate program of the GF and implemented by UNDP on behalf of the GEF Partnership. Uh, we provide financial and technical support to civil society and community-based organization in over 128 countries through 27,000 projects around the world. And we have been working with um, MSME's development and sustainability of it. 35% um, of these initiatives is geared gear towards microcredit and also revolving funds. And also we have been supporting many of the MSME developments, such as the green products like uh, Samuel mentioned and other ecotourism and other portfolio is also a large part of it. So the examples in this publication from different countries and continents, um, from Costa Rica, Ghana, and Vietnam, and Armenia, which is highlighted in brochure, I hope will give you a great, really good um, uh, inspiration and how we can further this agenda further, particularly on microcredit and saving scheme as we heard from our grantees right now, and also how we can develop MSMEs um, with a good partnership with a microcredit institution as appropriately and in the national context that we work with. And we hope this uh, local solutions that are championed by local partners can be uh, furthered um, through the Jeff 8 and others and Small Grants Program is ready to support further and uh, work together with GF and appropriate partners and strategically support a multi stakeholder platform and enhance the market value chain and see the sustainability of these mechanisms moving forward. So thank you again for this opportunity and I hope you will enjoy reading the brochure and learn further about the different initiatives globally. So thank you and um, all the very best. Over back to you, Susan. Thank you, thank you, Yoko, and I hope you have all been able to access the, the, um, the brochure. Let me now turn to uh, my colleague for the next uh, uh, panel, uh, my colleague, Jason Spensley. He's a senior climate change specialist who has extensive experience in the design of financial and technical assistance mechanism to strengthen design of country strategies and projects for addressing climate change priorities. Jason will moderate the next session. Welcome, Jason. Uh, thank you. Buenos dias, buenas tardes. Bonjour, bon après-midi. Um, I'm really enjoying this rich discussion. And now we're going to take a little bit of a shift to our second panel. In the previous session, we've heard from local points of light about how inclusive access to finance is benefiting local people, as well as producing global environmental and climate adaptation benefits. In this second panel, we're going to talk about bringing these local points of light to scale. We're delighted to have with us representatives of three uh, pioneering national and international microfinance institutions who will share with us their insights on opportunities and challenges for expanding the scale of local impact through green inclusive microfinance. Or as one of the uh, participants said earlier in the chat how we will cushion barriers uh, to microfinance access. I'll, I will briefly introduce each of the panelists and then ask them questions. Our first panelist is Araceli Castillo Gutierrez, who's the executive director of the Central American and Caribbean Microfinance Network called Red Camif. Red Camif supports 126 different national um, and local microfinance institutions, including by strengthening the focus on inclusivity 
with vulnerable local populations and, and generating environmental benefits. Araceli will speak in Spanish. Araceli, gracias por acompañarnos. Of the 126 members of Red Camif, 32 were explicitly focused on environmental and climate resilience impacts with its clients. Please tell us, Araceli, about Red Camif and about how the environmental and climate focus on microfinance can be increased in your region. Over to you, Araceli. Buenos días, buenas tardes o buenas noches a todos. Eh, muchas gracias primero por invitarme a, a participar, ¿verdad? En esta importante reunión. Eh, bueno, han sido experiencias, exposición, exposiciones muy interesantes, ¿verdad? Este, que hemos estado escuchando. Y bueno, este, como nos dice Jason, este, en Red Camif tenemos 126 instituciones afiliadas en la región. Y, y nos han reportado más, eh, 32 instituciones que están apoyando, financiando o tienen dentro de su portafolio de productos, eh, productos y servicios financieros verdes. Esto representa el 25% de las instituciones que están afiliadas a, la, a, a Red Camif y que están reportando también a Mi Fintech, que es el portal de información de, de, de las microfinanzas de la región, ¿verdad? Este, estas instituciones eh, tienen una cartera eh, verde de, de 175 millones de dólares eh, financiado y más de 93 mil clientes, ¿verdad? Por, apoyándoles con este tipo de producto. Eh, eh, prácticamente es el 6% del monto de la cartera de la región y el 6% también en, en el número de clientes. Pues son, son datos todavía muy muy pequeños, pero significativos, ¿verdad?, este, en este tipo de, de, de financiamiento. Eh, el, la experiencia que ha tenido Red Camif en, en, en apoyar este tipo de cartera en cuanto al diseño de productos, en cuanto a la capacitación también al, al personal de las instituciones en estos temas de cambio climático, este, eh, eh, es bastante fuerte y, y, y realmente ha generado eh, mucho impacto pues, en la región. Sin embargo, pues se requiere eh, pues, mayor, potenciar más, este, mayor esta, este tipo de cartera y acciones. ¿no? Eh, según un estudio que, que realizamos el año pasado sobre los desafíos y oportunidades eh, de las instituciones de microfinanzas para desarrollar este tipo de cartera, eh, como principal factor eh, nos eh, sale que es el fondeo adecuado, ¿verdad? Eh, fondeo adecuado realmente para desarrollar este tipo de, de producto. Eh, las instituciones, el 50% de las instituciones que están eh, brindando este tipo de producto lo están haciendo con fondos propios. Eso requiere realmente un esfuerzo bien importante. Eh, lo hacen porque son instituciones que tienen dentro de su misión apoyar eh, eh, en temas del medio ambiente, ¿no? a, a la población, a las comunidades que están atendiendo. Pero como hemos escuchado en, en estas presentaciones previas, el, el microfinanciamiento re, es bien costoso porque están llegando a clientes que son informales, agricultores o a productores que realmente no tienen este, eh, eh, formalidad en, en, su, en sus acciones, ¿verdad? O en, su, o en sus... Eh, parcelas, ¿verdad?, que están eh, produciendo, ¿no? Sin embargo, eh, las instituciones tienen que llegar a conocer a profundidad a estos clientes y eso hace muy costoso el, el financiamiento, ¿no? Entonces se requiere realmente de fondos adecuados, fondos adecuados este, en cuanto a sus características o... o, 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 o o también pues el, el tema de las tasas de interés. ¿no? Eso se requiere pues a ampliarlo, se requiere que las instituciones de microfinanzas puedan tener esas opciones de financiamiento para que este tipo de carteras realmente escalen a, 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 a números importantes ¿no? a, a nivel de la región. Otro tema importante también es la asistencia técnica no solamente para los clientes finales, no solamente para que estos 
pequeños agricultores que eh, eh, realmente implementen prácticas amigables con el medio ambiente, sino también el esfuerzo interno de la institución de capacitar al personal en estas temáticas, de incluso contar con algún especialista que, que esté fomentando en el diseño de producto financiero, eh, no solamente el tema de crédito, sino lograr el tema de microseguros también para disminuir los riesgos ¿verdad? de las carteras y también de, de los propios clientes. Entonces, esa asistencia técnica hacia el personal, hacia que el personal realmente logre este, apoyar después a sus clientes a, a desarrollar este tipo de práctica, también requiere un esfuerzo bien importante a nivel de la institución y por eso eh, es crear este, esa sinergia o esos ecosistemas más amplios ¿no? para que otros actores a, este, también apoyen al, 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 a la finanza inclusiva, ¿verdad? Tener esos ecosistemas a través de especialistas o instituciones especializadas en brindar ese tipo de, de, de asistencia técnica. ¿no? Eh, otro tema que hemos visto también que se requiere, ¿verdad? Fomentar y apoyar es el tema de la educación financiera. El tema de la educación financiera es muy importante porque no solamente implementar las prácticas medioambientales, sino también eh, fomentar esa, esa educación financiera entre los clientes para que también este, te, tengamos una sanidad este, financiera a nivel de las microfinanzas. ¿no? Bien importante también el tema de sistematizar experiencias. Sistematizar experiencias de estas prácticas eh, o, o de estos casos positivos, casos de éxito que están teniendo las instituciones con este tipo de cartera, es bien importante fomentarlos para crear también esa, eh, esa cultura de, 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 de que sí se puede hacer finanza verde con, 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 con experiencias exitosas y con resultados positivos. Nosotros eh, en Red Camif el año pasado hicimos en, en, en conjunto con el Grupo de Acción para la Inclusión Verde este, un foro de educación, de, un foro verde, ¿verdad? Que fue muy interesante porque presentamos prácticas este, o, o casos de éxito de instituciones que ya están financiando, eh, que tienen finanza verde y que están eh, innovando en este tipo de, de, de productos con muy buenos resultados, entonces eso motiva también a otras instituciones. ¿no? Ah. Araceli, uh, perdón, favor de resumir porque estamos cortos de tiempo. Ok, está bien. Eh, no, ya estoy terminando por ahí. Eh, entonces, este tema, este, este, esta, esta, esta práctica de estar sistematizando experiencia también es bien importante para presentar pues, al, a, a todo el ecosistema ¿no? que, que realmente se puede hacer finanzas verdes con, con buen impacto. Could, could everyone please uh, mute if they're not speaking? Uh, uh, Marcel uh, Bouquet, please uh, mute. Thank you. Favor de seguir Araceli, perdón. Le estamos escuchando, perdón Araceli. Sí. Estamos listos, Jason. Gracias. Okay, muchísimas, uh, thank you very much, Araceli, for, for a lot of insight. A couple of points I'd really like to highlight is you emphasize the importance of technical assistance, both to the, uh, to the beneficiaries, uh, to, to the clients in, in the microfinance terms, uh, and as well as to the microfinance institutions on the importance of and the value of nature-based solutions and of trans transitioning to climate resilience, as well as the importance of financial literacy of beneficiaries. We'll come back to you in a moment. Um, I would now like to shift to our next uh, speaker, our next panelist. Philippe Guichandu is the head of inclusive, micro, uh, of inclusive finance developments with the Grameen Crédit Agricole Foundation. Ramin Kedi Agricole is an international leader in inclusive microfinance with a strong focus of support in Africa as well as other regions. Philippe, merci pour nous joindre. 
Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation supports national and local actors, some of which are similar to those that we heard from in the first panel in accessing microfinance. Please tell me a little bit about uh, Grameen Credit Agricole and what you see as the opportunity and need to increase the scale of microfinance in helping vulnerable local populations transition to climate resilience and nature positive actions. Over to you, Philippe, thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Jason, and thank you to all of you. And uh, it's really a great honor and pleasure to be uh, part of this uh, panel and share with you the experience of the Foundation Grameen Credit Agricole that was set up in 2008 by the group Credit Agricole, which is one of the leading bank in, in, in Europe, but also by the Mohamed Yunus, the members of uh, the Grameen Bank, as it was already mentioned, is member of the board of the foundation with two other people from the, from the Grameen. We are basically investing in uh, right now more than 80 uh, companies, microfinance institutions and social enterprises in 34 countries. We are not in Latin America. I heard that we had a lot of uh, testimony from Latin America, but uh, maybe that would be an opportunity to, to set up um, uh, collaboration in the, in the future. Uh, regarding the specific issues that we've been discussing so far on environmental issues and, and climate change adaptation, I mean, it's true that we've been conducting a study among our members to try to figure out what was their perception, what they were doing and so on. And I think it's the, the result of our um, studies is really very similar to what was shared by RSLE uh, just a few minutes ago. In fact, um, um, I mean, around 65% of our partners are mentioning that um, um, climate uh, risk is really a key issue for them uh, because they have been already affected. Uh, of course, it varies according to the to the um, uh, to the region and so on. In Sub-Saharan Africa, is certainly the region, at least with our members, uh, partners. As I said, we are mainly working in in Africa, Middle East, Asia, Central Asia, a little bit of Europe. But um, so for our partners in Africa, clearly the risk is much much higher compared to the uh, to the other one, and it really affects um, the production of the smaller farmers they are dealing with, and it affects so their 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 activities and of course it increased the risk um, and the risk for a microfinance institution is the risk of not being uh, paid back. So what is very what was very interesting in, the, in, in, in this survey we, we conducted is to figure out that on one side they said okay we do have an issue there. 88% uh, of our um, uh, partners mentioned that I mean it's, it's it has to be done and it's part of their responsibility their social responsibility to do something with a with their clientele and to try to help them to face the climate exchange issue. So they, they, this, the, the consciousness is there and it's already very, very positive. But on the other hand, what we find out that only, for example, 16% of the, of the, of the governance level, I mean, and people were really interesting to do something on, on this. And that um, we see that there is a big gap between uh, the perception about and what is done concretely because there are not that many uh, of our partners have been involved in this, um, in this dimension and in this work. Um, what we, we find out also, which was very interesting, is that um, it seemed that if the clientele of, uh, of, of the MFIs are aware or if the clientele are requesting to be supported, then you will have a much bigger uh, impact and you will see that um, the MFIs will be really ready to do something and to be more involved um, in, in, in the subject. Um, and so it seemed that right now around 40% of our partners had um, the, some of their clientele that were requesting them to do something and to help them to support these um, environmental changes and, and all of this. So it's clear to me that, I mean, there's a, lots of things that still to be done that they are, and I think that what we have heard so far is that we do see some uh, partners and we do see some MFIs doing things. Uh, and we know that the sector has been working on these uh, issues for, for a while, but there's still a long, uh, a long way to go and there's still a lot of things that needs to be, um, uh, to be done. And if we ask our partners why they were not really transforming this um, uh, consciousness of doing something, I mean, they, they say mainly two things, is that for 78% of them, they lack 
funding uh, and specific funding. And maybe we will go back to all the issues of the interest rate and how to adapt the funding to this specific project. And 52% also lack expertise, uh, a clear expertise on understanding what is needed, what is, um, what is what type of support is done, what type of product can be designed to better fit this. And um, a vast majority also say that they need technical assistance. And they need, as it was mentioned by Jason and uh, Araceli, is that they need um, technical assistance at the level of the clientele and all this work to be done to um, to make them aware about the issues and to, to train the, the people and so on. And then there's a big need and a strong need to work at their level, at the level of the institutions. And so that, that's, I think, again, is something which is quite common. And I was very pleased to hear about um, what, what the, the experience here in, in South America, because I think that is something that is really common for uh, almost everywhere. Thank you. Philip, th thank you. Great insights on uh, the movements and what's needed to continue to go to scale on inclusive green microfinance. When you come back in the second round, we're going to ask you about um, your uh, experience, the, the experience of the foundation in developing monitoring systems and indicators for investment frameworks in inclusive green microfinance. Uh, that'll be interesting to hear more from you on. We're going to shift now to our third and final panelist, uh, Jose Miguel Mendez. Jose is the Agriculture Value Chain Coordinator of ADOPEM Credit and Savings Bank, which is the first, congratulations, microfinance institution in the Dominican Republic. ADOPEM has a strong focus on micro lending to help smallholder farmers get access to capital for transitioning to climate resilient practices. Jose Miguel will speak in Spanish. Jose, gracias por acompañarnos. Um, you've gained a lot of insight in the, through the journey of ADOPEM. And we understand that ADOPEM has a robust outreach and training program with your clients on ecosystem health and climate resilient farming and micro businesses. Um, please tell us about ADOPEM and share with us what you have learned. Eh, buenos días, buenas tardes y buenas noches. Gracias por la oportunidad. Pues en ADOPEM somos parte de la red CAMIF. Eh, somos esa red de la red dominicana que es REDOMIF. Y hemos tenido eh, un aprendizaje bastante largo por el tiempo que tenemos. Desde el inicio eh, fuimos ONG y esa ONG tenía préstamos para negocios urbanos y en el transcurso de eh, la expansión y el fortalecimiento de la institución nos eh, movimos principalmente al inicio eh, hacia las mujeres tomando en cuenta el perfil de exclusión social y financiera que había y aquí somos reconocidos en la República Dominicana como el Banco de la Mujer. Tuvimos un gran apoyo del WWF para el inicio y eh, a través de por los genes eh, in, eh, de ONG hemos tenido siempre una razón social acompañado de la razón financiera. Eh, en este caso, además del de crédito normal para negocio, incurrimos en el 2008 en probar agrocrédito. O sea, un crédito agrícola, tomando en consideración que es totalmente diferente a un crédito comercial. ¿En qué sentido? Primero, los niveles de riesgo que conlleva la actividad y después que la aplicación de pagos mensuales sucesivos era muy difícil en la parte agropecuaria, tomando en consideración que en agricultura se siembra, se cuida, se cosecha, se comercializa y ahí es que genera ingreso. Y por lo tanto, hay una carencia en los ingresos durante la etapa fisiológica del cultivo o de los cultivos. Y lo que hicimos fue que hicimos un ajuste al que ese crédito es un poco más flexible, con pagos libres o pago al vencimiento, tomando solamente eh, como pago el intereses. ¿Qué significa eso? Que le dimos la facilidad al productor de generar ingresos antes de que pueda tener la necesidad de pago de capital. Para eso hay dos, hay dos elementos importantes en este proceso. Lo primero es que conocemos la marginalidad de los clientes de eh, microfinanzas. 
Son clientes que muchas veces tienen poco acceso a servicios financieros formales y por lo tanto es un nicho interesante para microfinanzas que tenemos una operatividad muy diferente, que nosotros visitamos al cliente y no esperamos que el cliente visite la oficina. Y el otro elemento importante que tomamos en consideración que nuestros oficiales de negocios rurales tienen formación en agricultura o veterinaria o forestal. Por lo tanto, conocen el tema en que se va a desarrollar y eso significa los ciclos productivos, significa los rendimientos esperados, significa conocer los precios prevalecientes de los productos para hacer una estimación del ingreso que puede generar eh, la actividad. En el caso nuestro, por ley no, somos, eh, no tenemos posibilidad de ser asistencia técnica, pero sí orientación. Y en ese caso, esa orientación con personas que son profesionales, eh, muchas veces eh, lo que hace es que afinar algún tipo de, algún tipo de medidas eh, de manejo técnico del cultivo. Y sobre todo, que hay una, fre una visita frecuente, o sea, frecuentemente, cada 15 días, el oficial anda por su zona. Aquí hicimos una zonificación de que cada oficial de negocio tiene una zona donde podía colocar la parte agropecuaria y la parte de negocio como tal o comercio. Eh, otro elemento importante es que eh, para nosotros, y como siempre, la parte rural no, se, no necesariamente significa agricultura. ¿Por qué? Porque en las zonas rurales hay negocios, hay comercios, hay, hay industria de transformación a nivel pequeño, y por lo tanto eh, nuestra cartera se divide en dos, a, a nivel de los oficiales rurales, negocios y comercios rurales y agricultura. Eso incluye ganadería o crianza. En ese sentido, a partir de la agrocrédito, entonces ya pensamos en la parte eh, climática, tomando en cuenta que somos el quinto país con mayor vulnerabilidad climática en América Latina, que dependemos mucho del turismo, que el 75% de nuestra población está en las costas y estamos en la, en la trayectoria de los huracanes todos los años. Entonces, tomando en cuenta todas esas eh, vulnerabilidades, entonces introdujimos estas líneas de financiamiento verde como una forma de mitigar los riesgos a nivel local, a nivel de ecosistema, a nivel de eh, elementos de eh, eh, parcelas, a nivel de, de productor. Y en eso hemos tenido varios productos que hemos, bueno, ya tenemos cinco productos financieros verdes que va a responder a, y a a tener una adaptación a ecosistema y vinculado a, a diferentes proyectos que hemos eh, desarrollado, unos con apoyo de Recamif, otros con apoyo de MEVA, ONU Medio Ambiente, otros eh, CODESPA, que es una fundación española para la parte de agro, agrí, agrícola, y hemos tenido, ido, ido afinando eh, nuestra propuesta financiera y hasta ahora con bastante acogida. El último producto que hemos definido es de ganadería familiar sostenible para el fomento de la crianza a nivel familiar. Y eso ha tenido una gran acogida porque lo que promovemos son técnicas y sistemas silvopastoriles dentro de la pequeña crianza de los productores. Eh, un elemento importante, y lo mencionó Araceli, que tenemos un acompañamiento técnico, pero también un acompañamiento financiero a través de educación financiera rural. Tenemos unos documentos propios para eh, la capacitación a nuestros clientes sin costo para ellos sobre educación financiera rural vinculada a lo que son las eh, actividades y medio de vida de, esas, de esa zona. Eh, estamos incorporando ahora unos indicadores medio, de riesgo medioambiental con apoyo de MEVA, eh, un medio ambiente y con una institución eh, técnica para definir junto con el resumen de la solicitud de crédito que hay, el, de, el índice de riesgo financiero, estamos generando el índice de riesgo ambiental de ese cliente. ¿Qué queremos a futuro? A través de ese índice, generar un seguro que vaya vinculado, que la prima vaya vinculado a ese indicador. A mayor indicador, a mayor riesgo, la prima más alta. Si la persona va haciendo eh, actividades, implementando actividades para eh, mayor resiliencia de su actividad, la prima bajará en el sentido de que ese indicador sea favorable al medio ambiente. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a ti, José Miguel. It's really inspiring to hear about the trajectory and the learning being gained by the Dominican Republic's uh, Bank of the Woman, as you call it. Um, 
uh, your insight on the development of indicators and monitoring of, of tangible impacts is really um, useful. And I'd just like to highlight one point you made about the rural credit agents and the fleet or army of rural credit agents in Adopem and in uh, some, it, across all microfinance institutions going to the beneficiary, going to the client, not waiting in a beautiful uh, marble building in the capital city, but, but in a way that is, can be really transformative in reaching uh, vulnerable local populations and in, in, in a very power, it's a very powerful partner or asset in the context of the Jeff. So um, great appreciation there. We're now going to go back to our first panelist, Araceli. Um, thank you again. Araceli, we'd, we'd really like you to um, de delve a little bit more in accessibility of microfinance, including, could you, could you share with us um, your um, initial experience with a project which is supported by the Jeff's Special Climate Change Fund, the SCCF, uh, called CC Blend, um, a project that builds on MEBA, MIBA, as you've heard from some of the speakers, microfinance for ecosystem-based adaptation project expanded into CC Blend, supported by the Jeff SCCF. If you could uh, uh, deepen a little bit in this area, Araceli, uh, please. Thank you. Sí, Jason, sí, 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 te entiendo. Es hablar sobre el CC Blend. Okay, okay, sí, este, bueno, eh, este proyecto CC Blend es un es una facilidad de financiamiento combinado con asistencia técnica para la resiliencia climática de las cadenas de valor del café y cacao, ¿verdad? En El Salvador. Eh, esta facilidad va, va a incluir este, actores o la participación del Banco de Fomento Agropecuario del Salvador, que va a ser la, la entidad que va a estar este, implementando este, la, la línea de financiamiento y la asistencia técnica, Y este, también Red Camif, que vamos a estar con la parte de, de compartir la experiencia a nivel de la región, ¿verdad? De, lo que, de, de la experiencia que salga de esta facilidad y de otras que están implementando MEVA también en la región. Eh, todo esto apoyado con el Fondo del Cambio Climático del GEF. Eh, esta, esta iniciativa realmente es bien importante porque va a apoyar al Banco de Fomento Agropecuario a, a escalar lo que ellos ya han venido haciendo con la implementación de, de, del proyecto MEVA 1, ¿verdad? Entonces lo que se pretende es escalar esa, esa experiencia del Banco de Fomento este, para apoyar a estos agricultores en, en, en la cadena de valor del café y cacao en la implementación de prácticas amigables con el medio ambiente. Eh, también incluye una línea de crédito, un financiamiento con, que busca también unas mejores eh, condiciones específicamente en la tasa de interés ¿verdad? para estos pequeños agricultores para que, que potenciar alrededor de 4.000 productores de, en, en esta zona. ¿no? Realmente este tipo de facilidades son las que pueden eh, lograr escalar el financiamiento verde en los países, en, en las regiones. Como vimos la experiencia de, de Banco Adopen a través de José Miguel, José Miguel es un experto en el tema, entonces Adopen tiene eh, eh, esa persona que está impulsando esta temática verde en, dentro de su institución, capacita a los asesores de crédito, ese impulso realmente es bien importante eh, eh, para las instituciones, pero representa un costo bien alto y bien fuerte, y por lo cual este tipo de facilidades o de iniciativas Este, es bien importante para potenciar y escalar este tipo de financiamiento verde en la región y en, y en los países, ¿verdad? No es solamente el impulso de las instituciones de microfinanzas, sino se requiere de un impulso más fuerte en cuanto al fondeo, en cuanto a, a, a sistematizar y escalar esa asistencia técnica a nivel interno de las instituciones de microfinanzas como a través de los clientes finales también. Okay, bueno, gracias, Araceli. And um, especially for sharing the 
experience of the CC Blend project, of which at a, a, of which uh, Red Camif is a key partner, together with the Banco de Fomento Agropecuario of El Salvador, which is a Red Camif member, in in strengthening, in increasing the access to microfinance and the focus of microfinance provision on global environmental benefits, on climate resilience of uh, local partners and, and beneficiaries. Um, we'll now shift back to Philippe. Philippe, tell us about your experience with monitoring and your efforts in developing robust science-based and commonly shared indicators for environmental impacts, climate impacts, including with a very recently approved uh, project supported by the LDCF and, and the SCCF um, on um, investment frameworks um, and uh, monitoring systems for inclusive microfinance. Over to you, Philippe. Yes, thank you. And, and it's true that we've been, we've been very, very pleased to, to see that our project that we submit to the GEF has been uh, uh, approved. Um, um, the full title is Investment Framework for Increasing Climate Change Adaptation Finance for Smaller Farmers in Rural Communities. The idea is definitely, as, as I mentioned, to say is that we, uh, we believe that we need to, in the industry, in the sectors, we need to build up um, a clear framework so that, I mean, people, I mean, will be able to uh, clearly um, work on, on that uh, dimensions and we'll be able to support smallholder farmers with uh, clear uh, adapted product to serve and to help them for uh, in their climate uh, resilience pr uh, process. So the idea is definitely to try to, to work and, and that will be done through, uh, through the JEP. I mean, to try to, to set up clear um, indicators, I mean, clear in a clear framework that will be able to for us to provide uh, sustainable linked loans. I mean, uh, sustainable linked loans are loans that will be provided with a discount um, uh, prices because, I mean, the MFIs will have been able to uh, achieve um, a certain um, objectives that will be uh, defined. And of course, to be sure that this process will be well monitored, we need to have this framework. We need to be able to, to work on um, adapted uh, product uh, we need to train uh, the people uh, involved in, the, in, the, in this process. We need to, to, um, to disseminate uh, the results that will be uh, from, uh, from this. So all of this will be clearly, um, I think, the main, uh, the main objective. We, as I said, we didn't start from scratch. There has been already a lot of uh, initiative done. We have been discussing about, uh, for example, the green index that is already um, monitored. Uh, so there's already the grant for, for it, but now I think we need to, to scale it up. And that will be done through the, um, the um, and I'm very pleased to announce the creation of the, the JUST uh, Institute, which is the JUST Sustainability Transitions uh, Institute that will be uh, here to basically uh, work on all, all these issues on, on micro, uh, on not only for microfinance, but also for uh, all type of uh, companies and, and, and uh, society that will be interesting to work on biodiversity and environmental uh, issues. And we are also extremely happy because, I mean, Carlos Samuel, I mean, has agreed and we, have, we feel very honored to be members of the board of this uh, institute that will um, be there to produce things, to produce uh, documentation, to produce results, to support projects, to be very uh, grounded uh, with, uh, with the different uh, members of the, of the Institute. Um, I mean, BNP Paribas also in France is, will be part of the, is strongly involved in the, in the Institute. There will be an, ally, an, an alliance where we hope that most of the people are, um, that could be uh, around the table could join us uh, for this alliance so that all together we will be much stronger for, for helping the sectors to grow, to scale up all the initiatives that will be uh, linked to this um, uh, very important uh, themes. And that will be help, help, helpful to be sure that, I mean, we do it in a very professional way and concrete way. I mean, the idea is definitely to have uh, the framework that helps to, um, uh, to scale it up and to be sure that we all talk about the, the same thing. We try to, to help uh, the small order farmers to face uh, all the challenges they will have to face, or they are already uh, facing in this, uh, in this topic. Philip, uh, two quick reactions. The, the model 
of um, indicators and monitoring systems on environmental impacts, uh, mm. sustainability-based uh, financing is, is very exciting as a way to then reward the microfinance institutions with a focus on the green agenda with better terms, which therefore enable them to provide access, more accessible terms to their clients. Very exciting model. Um, and yes, uh, we're delighted to be engaging with you on the Just Institute and Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, the Jeff CEO and chairperson is delighted to be a member of the strategy board. Um, we are now quite short on time because we really want to, and, and, and we want to ensure the opportunity for engagement with, um, with all participants, questions and, and their insights. So um, uh, Jose Miguel, if you're willing, please bring your last interventions in response to um, comments and questions from, from, from the participants. So with that, we open up the floor to anyone who would like to make a, make, ask a question to the panelists or, or to share your insights. And if someone can please help me moderating the chat. Saraj Khan, okay, great, you've muted. Okay. Colleagues, uh, or, um, would anyone like to ask a question or share an insight with the panelists? If not, um, then I will invite you, Jose Miguel, to come back um, again. And your the, the focus on, on women um, specifically, can you talk us through how, how, how you achieve this and um, you know, the, the, the operations okay. of it. Give, bueno. us a, give us a sense, please. Okay, bueno, eh, eh, buenas de, eh, día, buenas tardes de nuevo. Eh, algo importante es que tenemos productos financieros específicos para mujeres. Por ejemplo, tenemos un producto que se llama Agromujer, que va directamente a emprendimientos de mujeres rurales. Ese, ese no tiene eh, eh, otro otro, otra meta, que no sea una mujer emprendedora ubicada en zonas rurales. Pero además tenemos un producto financiero que se llama Ecovivienda Adopem, donde tenemos lo que el, 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 la propuesta de, de arreglos, ampliación, construcción de viviendas, utilizando el enfoque sostenible, donde el 80% de las clientes son mujeres. Pensando en que muchas de las actividades como hogar, como alimentación, eh, son preocupación mayor en mujeres que en hombres. Y en este caso, el de ganadería familiar sostenible, esperamos que mujeres representen entre el 40 y el 50%. Y hasta ahora tenemos, eh, de los clientes que tenemos, 45% mujeres y 55% hombres. Eh, un elemento que hay que recalcar con la parte de la sistematización es que a través del índice de la de capacidad adaptativa, eh, lo que mide es la capacidad del cliente de adaptarse a esos cambios climáticos utilizando eh, prácticas y tecnologías. Tenemos un listado de tecnologías factibles de ser implementadas, donde de una lista original de 40, nosotros seleccionamos 17 que sí que cabían dentro de nuestra, eh, nuestra ruralidad. Y en este caso, eh, lo que instamos y favorecemos a implementar, en la unidad productiva es implementar elementos como por ejemplo conservación de suelos, como por ejemplo el uso de, de, de productos agroquímicos de menor, o sea, en vez de ser rojo, franja roja, sea franja amarilla o franja verde, que no es que deja de ser tóxico, pero son, es mucho menos la toxicidad, por ejemplo, y son cambios eh, paulatinos que se van haciendo, y, y por ejemplo, si una plantación está certificada, ya de por sí tiene posibilidad de un crédito verde. Tenemos una tasa diferenciada también para el crédito verde, como una forma de motivar el cambio. Ese indicador eh, está ya, lo tenemos ya sistematizado y tiene que ver con unas 57 preguntas vinculadas a 17 dimensiones y se genera automáticamente. Es de, de, de 0 a 1, donde hay la capacidad adaptativa de ese cliente a riesgo climático y 5 es la capacidad adaptativa muy alta. 
Y a partir de esa puntuación, nosotros podríamos por dos, dos cosas. Una, definir el monto de acuerdo al riesgo de la actividad, recomendar acciones de implementación y posiblemente vincular un seguro a la propia actividad productiva. Y en ese caso, eh, como cada vez que hay renovación de préstamo, hacemos un levantamiento de nuevo de cada uno de esos. Ese primer levantamiento nos sirve como línea base y vemos cómo va cambiando en el tiempo. Y en la hoja de resumen va a aparecer cada vez que se evalúe, que se levanten los datos, va a aparecer el puntaje. Y ahí vamos a determinar que además de su riesgo financiero de la actividad, va a haber un riesgo ambiental que va a ver, se va a ver histórico. ¿verdad? En el caso del producto financiero Ecovivienda, lo, lo que hicimos fue, hicimos un menú de opciones, un buffet, tipo buffet, vinculado en tres grandes grupos, agua y saneamiento, energía e iluminación, y el tercero, infraestructura y medio de vida. Y a partir de ahí, la persona va haciendo el crédito de la reparación de construcción progresiva, donde cada ciclo de producto puede, cada ciclo de, de, de préstamo puede seleccionar lo que puede pagar en ese momento. Al próximo ciclo se supone, o esperamos, que se generen ahorros y haya mayor capacidad de pago. Y ahí pues puede hacer... Por favor de resumir, porque tenemos un par de comentarios. Ok, sí. Eh, en ese caso, a través de, lo, de ese resumen de la de acuerdo a su capacidad de pago, se va aumentando su capacidad de endeudamiento para hacer las reparaciones que, eh, faltantes. Eh, muchísimas gracias. Uh, gracias a ti, José Miguel. Really, really um, illustrative. María Elena Gutiérrez, uh, we see that your hand is up. Uh, por favor, you have the floor. Uh, María Elena Martínez, ¿yo? Sí. Ah, gracias. Sí, por favor. Bueno, yo los saludo desde La Paz, Baja California Sur. Eh, mi comentario es sobre, eh, nosotros estamos desarrollando con nuestra cabeza de sector, que es la Secretaría de Turismo en México, eh, un proyecto de integración de criterios de biodiversidad en el sector turismo. Como parte de este proyecto que tenemos eh, en 2021-2025, en este, en este lapso vamos a generar información sobre cadenas de valor asociadas al turismo en áreas naturales protegidas. Creo que es una oportunidad precisamente para el proyecto, porque si bien estamos trabajando con información que, que se, está, se está generando incluso como diagnóstico, eh, eh, lo que es economía, género y turismo, y en estas eh, cadenas de valor que encontramos en seis áreas naturales protegidas y, y los aliados precisamente del turismo como son las, las grandes empresas, eh, por decir en Los Cabos, que están visualizando que ya no es el turismo sol y playa, sino que el turismo va hacia las cadenas de valor rurales. Entonces, tenemos ahí toda una oportunidad y quisiera saber eh, si hay algunos estudios donde se han fortalecido estas cadenas de valor rurales y comunitarias de turismo y cómo esos microfinanciamientos pueden llegar a fortalecer este, en este, pues, tres, cinco años, mediano, largo plazo, eh, como un modelo de desarrollo y como un modelo de, de financiamiento este, para estas regiones. Les agradezco muchísimo su consejo. Gracias. María Elena, gracias y saludos al Golfo de California. Um, so the focus and the opportunity of inclusive microfinance with the tourism sector and the benefits that the tourism sector provides to livelihoods as well as to global environmental benefits and to climate change adaptation um, through microfinance. Um, and, and to any of our panelists, uh, w w could you please uh, respond to that? Uh, Araceli or um, Jose Miguel, where the, given Dominican Republic is also a very tourism based um, economy. Would you like to share your insights? Uh, uh, sí. Eh, el turismo tradicional aquí en nuestro país es el de gran escala y muchas veces un pequeño productor para accesar a esa, a esa, a esa cadena de valor se le dificulta. Eh, sin embargo, hay proyectos eh, gubernamentales de reforzamiento de destinos alternativos donde sí estamos firmando un convenio 
un comercio para reforzamiento, educación financiera, en plan de negocios para esos eh, pequeños comerciantes, incluyendo la parte de manos ambiental y fomentando el crédito verde dentro de esas eh, carteras. Precisamente en estos momentos estamos firmando un convenio de colaboración con el Ministerio de Turismo enfocado al turismo alternativo en zonas no tradicionales. Pero sí tiene mucho potencial en el sentido de que esas pequeñas cadenas de comercialización le generan valor a cada uno de los integrantes y por lo tanto, y además, muchas veces los hoteles, por su política de responsabilidad social y ambiental, le dan preferencia a los pequeños grupos comunitarios y eso hay que tomar en cuenta. Ellos tienen una política de responsabilidad social y ambiental y privilegian incluso con los periodos de pago. Ellos a veces duran dos meses, tres meses para pagar, pero cuando es grupo comunitario, acortan el periodo para no descapitalizar a los comerciantes o pequeños productores o emprendedores. Muchas gracias. Y también este, un poco de experiencia es más que todo en el diseño de productos financieros, ¿verdad? Para, para este tipo de, 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 de sector, ¿verdad? Ahí hay unas experiencias muy, muy enriquecedoras sobre el tema de ecoturismo, principalmente en República Dominicana, donde han incluido también una serie de herramientas para evaluar este tema de cómo incorporar el tema medioambiental dentro de este tipo de productos, ¿verdad? Podríamos compartirle esa, esa parte. Gracias, Araceli. Gracias, José Miguel. Uh, very useful um, insights from within the Latin American and, and Caribbean region. We're not seeing other hands up or other specific uh, questions or comments in the chat for this panel. And so with that, and given that we're about uh, five minutes behind, um, I would like to um, end this session by thanking again the panelists, Araceli, Philippe, Jose Miguel, we're very appreciative of your time and your, and your um, experience. Um, and thank you for listening to, to, to everyone. And with that, I uh, send the floor back to my colleague, Susan. Over to you, Susan. Thank you, Jason. And thank you to all our panelists for an extremely rich discussion. Um, at this point, um, I, I, I think we were to invite uh, Natalia to round it all up very, very briefly. Um, Natalia, is this still happening or shall we? Yes. Yes, yes, so it's, it's still happening. It's only that I have uh, several notes and thought that there was like a, <laughs> there was like some minutes to um, bundle those notes. Uh, Jason, can, can I have these five minutes? Can we change? Can we, or? Yes, please. Go? Yes. Yeah. Yes, please. Five minutes. Okay, and we will try and see if we have any 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 questions. Maybe I will turn it over to Isha. Okay. Isha, you've been monitoring. Oh, sorry. You want to do the the wrapping up now, Natalia? No. Give me that five minutes. In five minutes. Uh, okay. Am... Super. Okay. Then I turn to Isha. Isha, if you could just take us through any questions that we might have in the chat or any questions, any hands up. Uh, now I turn over to you to manage this section of the proceedings, Isha. Sure, thank you, Susan. Great, so, so far I think we've had a very informative, interesting panel discussions regarding the two topics and have, been, have had different perspectives. And we have had question answers for each of the panels. But I think as an overarching theme for microfinance and green microfi uh, microfinance, do any, does anyone have any, you know, any other pending questions that they would like to ask? So we have Ronnie. Ronnie, would you like to speak or you would, would you like to um, say or? Yes, uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was following uh, uh, from uh, the, the speakers who presented 
But I am coming from a background where uh, we are in Zimbabwe. So my question uh, would be that how uh, does uh, different organizations encourage um, participation in uh, microfinance activities for the grassroots uh, groups, say in the rural areas and uh, semi-rural areas? Because I've realized that uh, in my country, they, uh, there is no activities or no organizations that are running micro microfinance specifically targeting uh, climate risk uh, projects or program or businesses. So I'd want to understand how best can this be developed for countries like where I'm coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Is there someone from the Jeff or one of our speakers or panelists who'd like to best answer this question? I can come in. Isha. Thank you, April. Go ahead. Um, and I, I think may, maybe the panelists will have some answers. And thank you so much for, for the question. Um, indeed, so in the mapping, that Natalia went through in her presentation, we see that there are many, uh, many initiatives that are existing worldwide, some of them in Africa, some of them in Asia and in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the reality is, as you say, that many of these microfinance institutions do not, are, are not yet ready to offer those types of financial services. What we are discussing or opening the floor here is that you know there are many models that one could explore, including what Fidel Pak uh, mentioned in the first panel. So how the SGP partner with a local credit, local communal credit organization, which is a foundation, it's not a microfinance institution, to create these not only technical assistance leg but also the sustainable financing throughout the years by this credit, right? That can be revolving in that circle and therefore the, the money does not write, uh, is not running out. It will very much depend on the reality of each country and who is active where uh, to build those types of, of, of partnerships. In some countries, microfinance institutions will be an answer as we can see, we've heard from some countries in the second panel, this is quite developed. In other countries, I would, I would argue that probably it's more on the foundation level or uh, the type of work that we've heard from Fidel Pak on, and also from Gurav on uh, social communal enterprises and how we partner at local level. So, so that would be my, my two cents, but I don't know if someone else would like to Come in. Yeah, I think I will add a little bit from my experience you know, on the ground. Time. Yeah. So, like uh, looking at, you know, the actors or the beneficiaries at the grassroots level, they might be like different level of, you know, this financial inclusivity. Because working, like my case, working with the grassroots, access to credit or financial institution is not even in the communities. And the community, like um, even the financial institution, are not willing even to risk and go there because there's no incentives. And even the people that have or they need a resource or capacity, they're even afraid to go to banks or credit institutions to even assess the loan. So what might work is to have a grassroots organization that work with the people themselves. Because like, they, like I said, people understand the socioeconomic challenges they face, they only need capacity. So that could be another level of doing that. Instead of going to the mainstream, in a credit union or like a bank or financial institution, it might not work in most contexts. So there could be like a different level that could take, you know, opportunity for that. So thank you. Uh, thank you, just uh, allow me to share a little bit. I think um, we also shared the experience that there should be a triangular approach and as a process, not as an event. So the accessing to the financial resources, accessing to the needful technical services, and the access to the market. These three things should continue as a process and then it will help. And when the access to the financial resources, it should be something like a revolving fund. 
because the same fund they can use for many times. And if not, only getting one time fund from the NGO or from the SME, and then it, is, it may not be enough for them. So they can uh, access to several times, many times and as it belongs to them. And then that can really add higher value. We have two experience in the same community. There is one international NGO, they are working there with microcredit. Their recovery is 57, 56 to 58%. Where we have our revolving fund, the community owned, community led. Their uh, collection is 99% because there was only one defaulter. Actually, he was sick. So he could not uh, complete his payments, but it could be uh, recovered. So this should be in a process, not as an event. Thank you. May I add something? Uh, um, I don't know much about Zimbabwe, but, but what I want to say, and wasn't really mentioned today in, in the discussion is the role of the government and the framework that the government can do and set up in order to boost um, <clears throat> financial inclusion. And I think it's very important because if you don't have the right, uh, the right uh, framework at the government level in terms of policy on how you're going to regulate the sectors, who's going to be the actors, who's going to provide the, the right license, uh, monitoring the good, we mentioned the good and not so good uh, institution and so on. Then that's something that is, is will be a, a big uh, a big issues. Uh, as far as I know, I think that, I mean, there has been, uh, we, we're working, we do have quite a few partners in, in Zambia, which is working very well. And we re, really are able to reach the smaller uh, communities at the uh, grassroots level. But I know at one point we were looking about opportunities to do something in Zimbabwe. And I think that there were very, very few actors. The sectors was very complex. I mean, the regulation was, was not that, that well uh, prepared there. So I think it's all these issues as well. I mean, that at the macroeconomic level, I mean, uh, if you want actors to be able to be uh, active, I mean, you need to have also the right, uh, the right framework. Just for quick comment. Yes, the role of the government must be inclusive. Because if the government is absent from this initiative, then there is a very big ch chance to be destroyed. It may not sustain. So the role of the government and um, in uh, financial mechanism, not only that, but also in the uh, risk identification, risk planning, and the local authority have to cope this into their local action plan so that there is a collaboration and uh, proper collaboration. If not, then it will not sustain. Thank you. Tal vez un comentario así rapidito, este, también esto es un trabajo de, de varios años, ¿verdad? No es algo que se viene realizando desde ahora. Por ejemplo, las redes de microfinanza también es un actor bien importante. Red Camif desde hace varios tiempos está eh, haciendo mucha concientización con las instituciones de microfinanza sobre el tema, haciendo capacitaciones sobre el tema, eh, apoyando en el diseño de este tipo de productos. Y también este, acercando a otros actores como los proveedores de asistencia técnica especializados hacia estas instituciones para que en conjunto realmente puedan hacer una oferta interesante para la población, ¿verdad? Entonces, también este tema de, de, de cómo aglutinar, de cómo, cómo, cómo trabajar todos en conjunto hacia, hacia adelante, eso es bien importante y es algo de concientizar tanto a las instituciones de microfinanza como también a los clientes finales. Thank you. Gracias, Arceli. Yes, oh, go ahead, April. No, 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 I was just, I, I wasn't sure you were going to come in. Great, thanks. <laughs> no worries. Um, do we have any more questions? Any other member from our audience here? Maybe Natalia. Is ready. Okay, so um, then I will share my screen. I have uh, gathered some some bullet points and notes from what we have discussed today to share with you um, the main messages that um, that we have heard and also messages to to the Jeff uh, how how this approach with microfinance could work. So let me start here. Let's 
sorry, I have I have multiple screens here. Natalia, in view of time, how much time will this take about? Okay, here's your conclusion. Okay, cool, go ahead. Yeah. Here it is. So we have uh, five conclusions. Let me start by the first one. Financial inclusion and literacy are key to strengthen resilience. There are different models and actors in the financial inclusion space. Relationships with the communities and local societies are key. Different models can work and train into clients and to institutions can boost motivations from both sides. And we have heard about agroforestry models, community models, village service schemes, contract farming scheme, and community enterprises that have been proposed. And innovations in needs identification have demonstrated their potential. Second, awareness raising building to end beneficiaries is relevant to local context on the design and suite of potential of climate resilience and natural based solutions. And here we have, and uh, we have heard today that training for clients can make a difference in developing the demand of green inclusive finance products and services, creating groups for coordination, needs understanding, and decision, decision of usage of funds and productive activities. Um, it's a model that have worked out, that have that has worked well. Communication campaign can have a great potential to change behaviors um, and, and this um, using also um, the current technologies or social media technologies, potential to further exploit, train and empowering women. The next, um, next one is we have uh, technical assistance to microfinance providers on valuing and monitoring climate resilient and natural impacts is key within their lending methodologies and can focus their, their capital on desired results. We have heard and we have seen microfinance is very expensive. We have characterized microfinance. They have a specific uh, methodology located a large outreach, they go to the clients and there is an, still several institutions have an analog approach. TA can support institutions to define metrics, to decide indicators and demonstrate to donors and further stakeholders in the impact that they have achieved. Going forward with the metrics, we have metrics and monitoring systems is a powerful way to focus and measure environment and climate adaptation impacts. Adopen, for, for instance, has integrated metrics and tools in the loan assessments and also in the loan cycles that enable them to uh, follow up on the climate risk of their clients. Networks such as Red Camif can support institutions in leveraging trainings, sharing expertise, and as well databases, um, as, MIF, as um, the one that is managing Red Camif as well can access or can provide access to data and play a role in sharing information that is key for decision-making. And uh, we heard also from the Jeff as well that private sector is well-placed to bring innovative solutions into, the, into this constellation of stakeholders. Last but not least, and this is the last uh, conclusion, ways to improve accessible terms and conditions of the finance for vulnerable beneficiaries include first, streamlining and systematizing lending processes, which reduce costs. And second, improve the terms of financing by using grant financing, non-grant instruments and blended finance. We have seen the potential of multiplying the funds and what can happen with this. So how in this ways, why, what have we heard today? It is important to identify the needs, understand clients, organize people, communities, ensure capacity building campaigns, trainings um, are given to both clients and also to institutions, evaluate the loan purposes, whether for individual loans, but also for group community loans, and in new approaches, reinvest in new productive projects or in um, the pressing needs that the community has, which have been working, proven working methodologies. Microfinance institutions need support 
to willing to risk, to innovate. Um, and here CSO can play also a role in pushing institutions or um, partnering for innovation. Organizations can align efforts to work together with financial institutions. Previous experiences can help to create synergies. We are not starting from scratch in green inclusive finance. There have been already several projects um, before. Also from these projects, we have new tools such as the Green Index uh, 3.0. We have as well experts gathering willing to share uh, their resources and uh, willing to commit and to partner with uh, different local actors and international actors. And, um, and last, la listen to the needs of both microfinance stakeholders, civil society to ensure fruitful corporations. If I have missed any, any other comment, important conclusion, uh, here the floor, if we have one minute more to open to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. I think we need another half an hour, which we don't have, because I'm sure there's yeah. lots of reactions that could possibly come in. Um, a very rich conclusion that will also help us as we move forward. Um, this is not the last time, this is not the first, the last time that we are we're we are, we are discussing this topic and we'll definitely come back to your notes and to this and to this meeting. And for that, I would like to thank everybody. But that's, let me ask, uh, um, given the time, uh, let me now turn to uh, our manager, uh, Paula Ridolfi, who is the manager of the Policy Partnerships and Operations Department within the Jeff Secretariat to give a vote of thanks and closing remarks. Paula. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you, everyone. And I'm very sad to close this very interesting session. Thank you for the experience that you generously shared with us. And uh, I am closing on behalf of our uh, CEO, Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, who together with our um, Director of Programming, uh, Gustavo Fonseca, are on their way back from London uh, on a plane. Uh, as Francois said at the beginning, uh, we really uh, were very excited for this session, which has become a tradition before every council meeting. But this time in particular, I must say, as Carlos Manuel would say, this was oro puro sin mercurio. This is pure gold without mercury, <laughs> of course, uh, because the knowledge that you shared and the enthusiasm and the innovation uh, are something that we treasure and uh, we need to build on moving forward. What we heard uh, from Sano at the beginning of this session is how access to credit through microfinance in an affordable and sustainable way is critical. And Natalia showed us the uh, linkages with the climate uh, impact of microfinance and green inclusive microfinance in particular to enable communities like uh, the ones you represent to act on climate change. And then we saw how Jeff initiatives at the CSO level, including the SGP, but also programs and projects uh, do include considerable funding for the CSOs uh, in the Jeff. Uh, and these are organically developing financial mechanisms that we heard from you today and that seek to be sustainable over time, no longer dependent from uh, financing. We heard also how access to finance is central to empowering women, uh, which goes to the core of our Jeff gender policy, which will continue to be implemented in Jeff 8 and monitoring impact um, through uh, indicators uh, is essential to reward uh, the MFIs who are actively involved in supporting communities and empower them to strengthen their engagement and ultimately expand their services for CSOs on the ground. This is an agenda which is directly uh, coherent with our new results framework that we're launching in Jeff 8. Uh, through the and, and it really supports the inclusion agenda that we are introducing as a way to work with CSOs in a more organic way uh, in our uh, replenishment in Jeff 8 that will come into effect uh, very soon in July with a very strong support uh, from all our partners. So in closing, I would like to thank uh, our keynote speaker, Natalia, our panelists and contributors, uh, Yoko, Jorge, Sam, uh, Gorav, Araceli, Philippe, uh, Jose Miguel, 
Uh, and of course, Avril and Jason, who lent their uh, really, uh, a really special and unique uh, technical exper expertise. And we're very uh, fortunate to have them as part of our team uh, in the JEFSEC. Uh, but also Gabriella, who initiated these consultations and she launched the new inclusive approach uh, in, uh, in JEF8. Uh, for bringing this agenda forward. Susan, for bringing us all together today and for organizing this excellent session uh, in every detail. Uh, Regine, for managing uh, the very complex organizational uh, aspects and for being in touch with every single participant uh, to follow up. Uh, Ted, for the technical support. Mikael, uh, for um, being there. And Isha, for moderating uh, again um, with us, for being with us also in this new uh, consultation. So the appointment is to council next week. Uh, so please uh, rest over the weekend or travel to see us if you are traveling. And we hope to see as many of you as possible and uh, to remain in touch uh, for the long run. Thank you again. Gracias y merci. And uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you all. And we thank our thank interpreters. You. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you all. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>